Bettina, let's get down to business. The opening session, what will that consist of? Um, we will start out with a greeting from our hosts of this forum. And thereafter, we will have two keynote speakers who will inspire us and share the importance of the Baltic Sea Corporation. And after the opening, uh, we will have three plenary sessions during this day, focused on how to develop more innovative and sustainable cooperation. The first session will establish a baseline. What do we already do? The second plenary will explore promising areas of cooperation. And the third plenary will look into the future, which policies and programs will guide the future of the EU SPSR. And we'll have uh, in very interesting panels during all these three sessions as well, yes. with a lot of panelists, and more of that later. Great. So, hey, without uh, uh, further delay, let's listen to the welcoming speeches. And first on stage, let's welcome Minna Arve, mayor of the city of Turku. Very much welcome. Thank you, Peter. Dear friends and colleagues across the Baltic Sea region, I wish you warmly welcome to the very first online USBSR <laughs> annual forum broadcast here from my home city, Turku. Due to the pandemic, it's not possible for us to host you in person, but we were very honored to broadcast this virtual annual forum here in Logomo in Turku and gather us all together online. Turku has a long history in working to advance cooperation in the Baltic Sea region, especially in the fields of environmental protection and sustainability. This year, Turku was selected as the best mid-sized climate city in Europe by the European Commission based on the information in the Covenant of Mayor system. For us, this is an honor and a recognition of our pervasing work. Through systematic strategy-based work, Turku will be carbon neutral by 2029, when the city celebrates its 800th birthday, and climate positive thereafter. This is the birthday present that we, the city's inhabitants, will give to each other. Our common goal will be achieving by speeding, achieved by speeding up the transition towards circular economy and resource wisdom by finding new climate solutions together with companies and educational institutions by investing in renewable energy, low carbon mobility and sustainable urban structures and by adding carbon sinks and adopting a local emission compensation model. We need everyone, also businesses and the residents, to pitch in for this goal. There are many ways to live sustainable, and in Turku, we believe that each of us is a climate change maker. Dear friends, also the annual forums of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region have a long tradition. Turku applied to host this year's forum, even though it was not Finland's turn to do so, because we want to be a significant actor and partner in the Baltic Sea region, and with our actions to influence in a positive way to the region's development. It is an important part of the city of Turku strategy. The EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region supports the efforts and developments we are making also in the local level in our city. Currently, the updated USBSR action plan will provide possible pathways to the future towards a decade of innovation and sustainability, which is the theme of our forum. The successful implementation of the new action plan is of great importance. And this is one of the primary reasons why the structure of this year's annual forum has been created to cover all the focuses of the strategy. Save the sea, connect the region, and increase prosperity. This year, the annual forum is carried out in a new format in challenging circumstances shared by all of us. However, the organizers did not wish to cut down on the quality of the forum. We have the same elements as always with plenaries, workshops and the networking village and most importantly, top decision makers and experts forming a high standard program and discussions. 
I take this opportunity to warmly thank to the co-organizers of the forum, the CBSs, as well as the Finnish Ministry for the Foreign Affairs, the European Commission and other partners. This has been a joint effort with extremely good cooperation. I wish us all fruitful discussions and networking. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arve. And I think, you know, our green wall actually looks very good on, on, on the screen and, and reminds me of all the coasts of the Baltic Sea region. So uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a good idea to have this sort of a, of a background. And, and actually, I'd say uh, during the rehearsals, I think we've all struggled with the EU SBSR. And Bettina, you said that we can, we can use basically just the word strategy. I would say so. That's yes. much easier. Thank you. Let's us off the hook. After Mayor Arve, uh, please welcome Ambassador Grzegorz Poznanski, Director General of the Council of the Baltic Sea State Secretariat, and he'll be online from Stockholm. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome from Stockholm and the seat of the CBSS. Uh, uh, I'm Polish and I work in Sweden right now. And I'm extremely happy that I had an opportunity to be uh, present at the first, very first USBSR annual forum in Tallinn 10 years ago. And I'm right now present in the first forum in Turku. Uh, I want to welcome you all on behalf of the Secretariat of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, registered to this first annual forum. Uh, to this first virtual annual forum. I wish to join uh, uh, Mayor of Turku in thanking the joint team of the city of Turku, the CBSS and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland for their hard work in bringing this forum into reality. Together we have proved that international cooperation continues despite the difficult pandemic time. The CBSS is proud to be one of the most active members of the wide network of organizations and individuals implementing the EU strategy. The CBS Secretariat has been hosting one policy area and two horizontal actions and running several strategies flagship projects. Through coordination, coordinating of the policy area secure, we work to build safe and secure region for all of us around the Baltic Sea. Thanks to coordinating uh, horizontal action neighbors, we managed to deepen cooperation between neighbors, but between the EU and its neighbors. It's under the, our CBSS roof that experts from the EU countries can meet their peers from Norway, Iceland, Russia, and other neighbors, neighbors and exchange knowledge, best practices, and build long-lasting professional relationships. We are also proud that CBSS was given task to coordinate the horizontal action climate of the USBSR. As it doesn't need to be explained, we need the focus on climate issues. In the CBSS Secretariat, we are particularly proud and happy that thanks to our Baltic Sea Youth Platform experience, we had an opportunity to organize virtual Baltic Sea Youth Camp just before this annual forum, and that we contributed to the voice of young generation to be heard at this annual forum, loud and clear. Let me present you the declaration that was adopted by the young people. You can find it on our CBSS website, cbss.org. Please read what they want us to hear how they see the European Union strategy as a whole, and all policy areas. They developed the whole set of proposals for each policy area. And here in the Secretariat, we believe strongly that youth should be not only heard, but also involved in the implementation of the goals of the USBSR. The COVID-19 crisis shows that no country is immune to global threats. As the CBSS Secretariat, we are ready to foster all joint initiatives because a truly sustainable, safe, and secure 
and connected region can only be achieved through cooperation, collaboration and trust. That is our motto in the CBSS. And thanks to the spirit of true collaboration and genuine trust between all stakeholders, we'll be able to achieve our goals. I'm sure that uh, the main philosophy of the forum, gathering cross-sectorial, multidisciplinary teams to tackle the common issues in the region, will help us all to see where we are now, determine the areas where the cooperation should be intensified, and look into future of our region, which depends on you, gathered here, physically and virtually. Organizations, states, regional organizations, regions, cities, NGOs, academia, stakeholders, as I've said, young generation, all of us. All of us can make the next 10 years of the Baltic Sea region the decade of innovation and sustainability. Let's put our Balticness spirit at work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Poznanski, for your inspiring words. And now for the forum's first keynote. So please welcome former president of Finland, Tarja Halonen, champion of the Baltic Sea region cooperation, as she'll be online from Helsinki. Welcome. <laughs> So, thank you very much, Peter. So, really, my best greetings from, uh, from the present capital of Finland to the beautiful former capital of Finland, to Turku. So, uh, really, dear friends, the Baltic Sea is one of our common nominators, uh, the people living around the sea. Uh, for hundreds of years, it has fed us with uh, its seafoods. It has been the road for the exchange of goods and the culture. It has been the source of prosperity, joy and happiness. And it has also been the stage of many wars. However, for the past uh, 70 years, we have enjoyed peace and increased prosperity in our region. We have slowly built stability to our region through trade and cooperation. To continue this trend, we need to work to further define new ways and working together. Our sea has been very useful for us, providing us with food, transportation and recreation. We should be reciprocal and return the favors we have received. We all know that the nature of the Baltic Sea is very special. It is shallow sea with the brackish water depending on the pulses of the salty water from the Atlantic. The sea is fragile, and if something serious happens, such as an oil accident, it takes a long, long time before the sea recovers. So far, we have not uh, uh, luckily seen large environmental accidents in the Baltic Sea thanks to the precautionary actions. However, the state of our sea is not good. Already from the 1960s, it has been clear that the ecological state of the Baltic Sea has been declining rapidly. After the research uh, done on our sea, we have been able to see the growing problems and to identify the causes. I'm just um, feeling the echo, so I think that we have to close something here, but anyway. So, um, uh, I think that uh, sometimes um, uh, it's said that the Baltic Sea is really, uh, it's the most studied, some people say even that it's the most, most polluted sea in the world. And now we need different players to come and act together for our common good. Luckily, however, we have a good record of cooperation. We have the world's oldest intergovernmental science organization, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which has mapped the sea for us for almost 120 years. We have the Helsinki Commission, which has focused on protecting our sea for more than 40 years. On top of this, since 1990s, we have seen many other networks and organizations to emerge, EU members, Nordic countries, coastal cities, universities, companies, NGOs, and even individual people have joined their efforts to work together, as we can see also today. Uh, the agreements have given us a clear targets and 
China who has the agreements to take a route. After Rio uh, 1992, the Baltic Sea was one of the first regions where the ecosystems management approach was taken up, as it was intended in the Rio 92 declaration, the so-called Agenda 21. This was thanks uh, uh, to the work done by the Helsinki Commission and uh, the history of cooperation we have. Now, what's now? Well, now the main challenge is the full implementation of agreements. And uh, my task is perhaps a little bit uh, give a picture how we have done it in the past. The implementation can be done at different levels. In our Baltic Sea region, international cooperation is often needed because different coastal states depend on one another. So I take a few examples for you. Uh, for instance, the renovation of the old wastewater system at St. Petersburg was a good example of that. The system was really very old, but the uh, city itself was not able to do uh, by its own the renovation. Both the national and international cooperation was needed, and also the private sector was involved. So we have to get the support from the EU and European banks for the new waste water system. Uh, this is one of the examples of coordinating the work of the local, regional, national and international actors and getting financing from various uh, sources, public and private. It was not really easy, but it could be done. Now, after wastewater treatment systems have been upgraded, there are other factors that put a pressure on the Baltic Sea. The food production is important for our region, and it's, um, I think, around 90 million people. But the pressure our food production systems put on the environment give us a large challenge. So, dear friends, at the times, we need to step up to the global level in order to make reforms in our region. I remember when the marine traffic in the Baltic Sea was really increasing, and with it, of course, the risk of accidents. Also, many ships were emptying their waste directly to the sea. And, of course, we wanted to stop it. And we needed for that the global agreement. The idea was to get the status of particularly sensitive sea area or PSSA for the Baltic Sea. <coughs> the International Maritime Organization, IMO, recognized these areas and those where special care and standards are implemented for the shipping industry. So we succeeded to get the PSSA status to the body. <coughs> Sorry, this is my allergy always in the, <coughs> in the inside. Not, not anything worse. So, but when we got this uh, status, so everybody could think that we were, everybody enjoyed, enjoyed that, enjoying that, but no, uh, not everybody liked it. Even few Finnish enterprises did not like it at all. We were trying in different forums, and this time the global and UN-based forum was the only right one. And that can happen also in the future. Many of you know these old stories at least as well as I do. Uh, but uh, my main idea is now today to remind all of us how cold we riot of the possibilities we have. My message is that we have to find the right partners and forums for our actions. During my presidency in um, 2010, together with Prime Minister Matti Vanhanen and the Baltic Sea Action Group, we organized, for instance, a summit, summit for representatives of the coastal states, business universities, and NGOs. Uh, we were, in the beginning, how could I, somebody could say that we were quite crazy 
But finally, we had about 500 people in the summit, all the way from, the, from Mr. Vladimir Prud to Putin to the King Carl 16th Gustav of Sweden, to Ilka Herrin and Johan Nurmin and Lisa Roveda, to the business and NGO leaders and all the activists. So we all together managed to make 140 commitments for the protecting the Baltic Sea. It was a great push forward. So we were very happy that so many made a this, uh, this uh, 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 promises. But what's important, we have followed them afterwards, and uh, then uh, some have been very active, some others could need another push. So uh, what is the lesson? We should keep our minds open. Sometimes the right forum might be an informal one, such as an international music festival where new ideas and inspirations can be found and new friends found. Uh, the key is to find the right level and the right forum. And I'm very sure that you today are very right persons to do that. Before ending, I want to say that you all now who are following this, you have done a lot of work for the Baltic Sea region and the plenty of achievements uh, have followed. Um, the work of Helcom and those who have stepped in ever since, uh, such uh, as uh, Esther Schaeffond and John Lumen Foundation, Baltic Sea Action Group and the other organizations and cities, you have all done a tremendous work in this field. But what I will say, this is a good start and we have to continue in the same way and even better. So today, my dear friends, uh, we are at the point where we see cooperation at different levels, local, national, international, and um, this uh, meeting demonstrates this very well. Uh, we are here to develop and share our ideas, how to work together in making our region more sustainable and prosperous. Uh, today and in future, I'm uh, very much hoping to hear your ideas and plans for our region, and I look forward to work together with you. So um, I'm also very happy that Toko has organized this now in internet. So we say that nothing can stop us, not even the COVID-19. And um, so I hope uh, from, the, from our part, from here, from Helsinki, very inspiring discussions uh, good luck uh, and persistence to, for your work. And uh, now I'm very happy to, to get also the EU representation here to tell us that what new ideas they have. So thank you very much uh, that you have invited me. Thank you, Chris, and Helen, for your enlightened and, and hope-inspiring words. And, and of course, there's a bit of an echo and stuff, and that's what we get when we're meeting online, but it's anyway better than not meeting at all, so we'll have a lot of different sort of sound experiences during the day, but I think we, we got the message uh, well and clear, so, so we could at least hear. Uh, we, uh, so, Peter, we tried also, Peter, we tried also here, we stopped one of the okay. mics, so that, I hope so, that you didn't listen to me all the time as a double. Is enough, I no, no, we, 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 got, we got it sort of well and clear here, so I think the sound was all right. A bit of an echo, but it didn't disturb us, so it's okay. <laughs> Thanks. And that was <laughs> President Halonen from, as she said, the new capital of Finland. We, we are here in the old capital of Finland, Turku, Orbo. So, an interesting sort of anecdote as well. Anyway, uh, now we'll uh, watch a keynote uh, on video from Commissioner Elisa Ferreira. Uh, cohesion and reforms European Commission. President Alonen, Mayor Harvey, ladies and gentlemen, I very much regret that we cannot all meet in the wonderful city of Turku today. The pandemic still prevents us from leading our normal lives. I hope we will be able to overcome this soon. The topic of this year's annual forum is our region, our future, preparing innovation and sustainability. A prerequisite, let me make this small insert, for a prosperous future are stable and functioning democratic systems. This is a pillar of our union and the centerpiece of the relations with our neighborhood. 
This is what we support and wish to see also in Belarus, which is a neighboring state of some of the Baltic countries. Now, my contribution to, the, uh, to discussing the challenges of our future uh, will focus on this twin transition. The twin transition to a green and digital economy in the challenge of our generation. Since the beginning of the COVID crisis, the need for this transition has become even more apparent. COVID highlighted weaknesses in our regional economies, especially those dependent on a few industries. We now have an opportunity to rethink our patterns of commuting, producing, consuming. Not to return to the old normal, but to find a better new normal. An opportunity also to mobilize the exceptional financial firepower at our disposal. In addition to the normal cohesion programs, investing in the long-term transition of all regions, we have the instrument of REACT EU. It's 47.5 billion euros of additional funding, a bridge between the current economic recovery efforts and the long-term transition. A substantial part of these resources will be directed at the green transition. Our vision as a Commission is for Europe to become the world's, world's first climate neutral economy and to transform to a circular economy. The European Green Deal is our new growth strategy and cohesion policy is a key investment tool to deliver it. Our investments will transform many sectors of the economy, notably transport, energy, agriculture, buildings, industry. These issues have also been well reflected in your new Baltic Sea Action Plan, for which I want to commend you. Cohesion policy can finance many green investments. To mention just a few, which are of relevance to you, the renovation wave and energy efficiency in buildings, supporting innovation in the circular economy or in more sustainable products, and bringing nature back into our cities. To achieve Green Deal objectives, we need sustainability transitions, where partners identify unsustainable solutions, such as fossil fuels and waste incineration, and cohesion policy invests in solutions. A good example is your Effect for Buildings project, a comprehensive toolbox of energy efficiency measures supporting public building managers in retrofitting, upgrading and deepen renovation. My second point, cohesion policy invests in the digital transition. Digital technologies are changing our lives, the way we work, shop, communicate. But evidence suggests that only one in five European Union firms is highly digitized. Most small and medium enterprises, in fact, still lag behind in digital terms. Let's not forget that this has a strong territorial dimension. I trust you to bring digital to the regions. In the 2014-2020 period already, cohesion policy provided more than 21 billion euros for digital investments. This sum will almost certainly increase in the coming years, focusing on digital infrastructure, e-skills, e-inclusion, e-governance, business development and intelligent transport solutions, mainly in less developed areas. Cohesion policy also helps making Europe fit for the digital age by building national and regional capacity for deploying broadband. This is a crucial precondition for digital investments to succeed and becomes an enabling condition for digital funding in the new period. Many of the Baltic Sea region programs are showing already the way in terms of good practice. For example, many regions lack the methods or institutional frameworks to successfully implement a smart specialization strategy. The Baltic Sea region 
S3 ecosystem platform shares best practices. It also activates research and academic communities, industry and public entities to strengthen the regional innovation ecosystem. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, your new action plan and today's annual forum are important steps towards transition and cohesion in the Baltic Sea region. This is important for Europe. We must use this opportunity to prepare and to kickstart implementation of the Green Deal across the region and beyond. This for me is confirmation of the Baltic Sea strategy's role in promoting development in the region as well as the European Union priorities of the European Green Deal and the European Digital Strategy. With 750 billion euros of European funding through Next Generation, we have a window of opportunity. Let us seize this opportunity to implement the priorities of your action plan. Thank you for your contribution. I wish you health, happiness and fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. And many thanks to Commissioner Ferreira for her inspirational keynote words. And now, actually, it's uh, uh, time to get towards, towards our first plenary. But let, let's watch, watch a video here before we, we get to that point. We might not need the video. No, okay, so who needs a video when we have talk, <laughs> live talk on stage? So anyway, hey, uh, Bettina, we're heading towards uh, our first plenary session. I'll introduce the panelists too, but what will this first session be all about? Uh, the first plenary and panel discussion is about what type of cooperation that work. Uh, the Baltic Sea cooperation covers on many different topics and in many different formats. We will ask our panelists whether and how these current cooperation formats deliver innovative and sustainable solutions across the objectives of the strategy. And we will have the opportunity to discuss examples of cooperation in different fields. Also, the Baltic Sea cooperation has been impacted by the pandemic. And we will therefore also discuss with our panelists what effect have, has this had and what does it mean to cooperate in when it's not possible to meet face to face. Can we maintain effective online collaboration? Uh, and Bettina, in your conclusion after the panel, I'm eager to hear your own thoughts on, on what you just said and what the panelists say. So we're, we're then waiting for that as well. But anyway, uh, before the panel, let's uh, watch a keynote video from Commissioner uh, Virginius Sinkevichus. Dear Ministers, dear participants to the 11th Forum of the EU Strategy for the Baltic Sea Region. A very good morning to everyone. And many thanks to Minister Krista Mikkonen for inviting me to this forum. The Baltic Sea Region has a long tradition of cooperation, as evidenced by the multiply networks and organizations in the region. Based on this tradition, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region provides a unique platform for cooperation and coordination with open and transparent participation and multi-level governance for EU and non-EU countries. During the past decade, this platform has been successful in engaging a wide range of stakeholders to network and cooperate, thus improving coordination and enhancing synergies. The 11th Annual Forum of the EU Strategy for the Baltic Sea Region and the Revised Action Plan will be important steps towards innovation and sustainability and towards even more achievements in the region of Baltic Sea. One of the three key objectives of the EU Strategy for the Baltic Sea Region is saving the sea. This objective is particularly crucial today, considering the dire situation of our dear Baltic, choking with nutrient runoffs and where unsustainable fishing practices have led, for example, to bycatch of harbour purpose. Dumping of contaminants and other pollutants such as marine litter are also a problem. 
we have a shared responsibility to protecting the Baltic through our agricultural practices, through our fishing methods, and through the way we take care of its environment. We need to act all together. That's why on 28th of September, I called for our Baltic Conference to tackle these issues together. On 28th of September, for the first time ever, EU ministers of agriculture, fisheries and environment of the Baltic Sea member states committed together in a common political declaration to boost efforts to bring the Baltic Sea to a good environmental status by reducing key pressures. Our Baltic declaration is based on legislative and policy engagements that we have already taken, but it aims at providing us with further resolve to fulfill our commitments in a comprehensive and integrated way. These commitments are also embedded into the new an ambitious policy context of the European Green Deal and the actions that need to be taken in the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies, as well as for the forthcoming zero pollution ambition. Political will of all Baltic Sea littoral countries is what we need and what can make things move forward. A coordinated and comprehensive response from Baltic Sea countries is what the Baltic needs. In this regard, I also warmly encourage the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea regions to pursue its close cooperation with HELCOM, the regional convention protecting the Baltic Sea. The HELCOM ministerial declaration is adopted in 2018 is also an example of regional cooperation, paving the way towards an updated Baltic Sea action plan to be adopted in 2021. In particular, this declaration called on all partners in the region to work together to ensure synergies between the priorities of the HELCOM Baltic Sea action plan and of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region action plan. Projects of common interest under the strategy have indeed su substantially contributed to implementing the HELCOM Baltic Sea Action Plan and improving regional ocean governance. This should be pursued and strengthened. The session, which I have to honor to open today, also calls for cooperation in the domain of innovation. Innovation is essential to boost productivity and growth in the Baltic Sea. In this regard, Horizon Europe is the most ambitious research and innovation program. Yet, under this program, missions are new delivery instruments, which will support innovation by mobilizing people and funds to scale up solutions to the societal challenges of our time. In particular, the Ocean and Waters mission will help developing new business opportunities linked to the restoration of aquatic ecosystems and the development of a sustainable blue economy based on technological and societal innovation. At regional level, BONUS, the joint Baltic Sea Research and Development Programme, represents a good example of support for research and innovation, which produces knowledge, scientific evidence and the innovation solutions we need. Such initiatives will be continued under the future climate-neutral, sustainable and productive Blue Economy Partnership under Horizon Europe. Smart specialization is also key for regional development through research and development investments. Entrepreneurial discovery process, multi-stakeholders engagement, it represents a fundamental means to support and implement the sustainable blue economy priorities, both at local and transnational level, through innovation Baltic region. Similarly to other regions in Europe, has a key role to play to support blue economy by mobilizing EU funds, integrating blue economy in the smart specialization strategies and make meaningful contribution to the national resilience and recovery plans. Macro-regional strategies such as the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region offers the ideal background to boost smart specialization, transnational dynamics as they support multilateral dialogue and cooperation in economic sectors of common interest. The flagship project Smart Up is a perfect example of how this can happen in practice. In this perspective, the European Commission supports macro-regional strategies and sea basin strategies as means to explore innovation investment opportunities, new value chains and new business segments of blue economy. 
In conclusion, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region is a successful initiative that has brought significant results in the diverse areas such as innovation, safety and pollution prevention, or reduction of plastic and air pollution in the Baltic Sea. It has also contributed to the shaping and developing policy on energy, navigation, environment and climate change. Tackling environmental issues in the Baltic Sea Basin is one of the areas of cooperation within the strategy. The stakeholders confirm that more cooperation has developed in water project, as the strategy provides an opportunity to focus more on tangible solutions and to target objectives specific to the Baltic Sea region. And the implementation of actions under the strategy has continued to support the implementation of relevant EU legislation and policies. Thank you. And I wish you all a fruitful discussion today. And thank you, Commissioner Sinkevichus, Environment, Oceans and Fisheries of the European Commission. And next, uh, Minister for Transport in Latvia, Talis, Mr. Talis Linkaitz, was unable to attend the live panel, so we have his pre recorded reflections first before we go to the panel. Dear guests, uh, dear colleagues uh, of the Baltic Sea region, it is my pleasure to participate in this EU-SBSR forum, unfortunately this time via pre-recording. But nonetheless, I'm happy to share Latvia's input towards successful cooperation in the Baltic Sea region. This event is very important for everyone involved in the Baltic Sea region. Thus, it is our responsibility to have an open and transparent discussion our future will benefit from. Despite tough situation in the world, we have found ways to stay connected and we have seen that what works and what doesn't. And I think it is one of the findings that we can apply towards developing stronger partnership among actors who represent the Baltic Sea region. Therefore, let me start by addressing great cooperation cases that has led Latvia into becoming more involved in the region, having environmentally friendly mindset and being a front runner in different events. An excellent example of regional cooperation in the Baltic Sea region is Northern Dimension Partnership for Transport and Logistics, which is a unique platform for cooperation, joining forces of several EU countries and neighbouring countries. Under chairmanship of the steering committee that Latvia was chairing last year, Latvia's main priority was to continue working on bringing the Eurasia transport system closer to the countries of the Northern Dimension Partnership. During the chairmanship of the steering committee, Latvia organized two thematic seminars within the partnership. First, Northern Dimension Strategic Transport Network and its extension towards Asia, where representatives of the partnership countries discussed previous transportation experience in Eurasia and agreed to continue their work on extension of the partnership transport network to the Asian countries, for example, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, China or the Far East. Uh, the other seminar was digitalization of transport and logistics, where member states presented their experience, projects and ideas related to the use of electronic solutions in transport and logistics services. In addition, Last year, Latvia signed the declaration on the continuation of the partnership for the next five years, as well as approved prepared partnership performance assessment report, highlighting the uniqueness of the partnership's activities in the region, as well as the areas of future priority actions, and agreed on five main priorities for the future work of the Northern Dimension Partnership. So these five priorities are meeting the need for reduction of greenhouse gases, vision zero, digitalization, new emerging trade routes and sharing best practices in transport education. 
In this framework, in November last year, I had the pleasure to participate in a high-level conference, a clean and global north, organized by Finnish presidency of the EU, dedicated to the 20th anniversary of the North Dimension, where the main points of discussion were enhancement of connectivity in the region and beyond in a smart way, in order to achieve ambitious climate goals that should be one of the priorities in the region. From July 2018 to July 2019, in its turn, Latvia had another important responsibility since we held the presidency of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. During this period, Latvia was responsible for organizing the work of the expert group on sustainable maritime economy. The Ministry of Transport, together with CBSS and the European Commission, DGMAR, organized the conference Development of Sustainable Maritime Economy, Opportunities and Challenges for Small and Medium Ports in Baltic Sea Region. In the conference, the role of small and medium ports in the region and local governments were discussed, their challenges as well as development opportunities and financing instruments for development implementation. Furthermore, to sustain and promote the necessity for international cooperation, it is important to stress that successful regional cooperation also results in participating in projects that lead to benefiting one's national transport system and improving its efficiency. I would like to mention an example of Maritime Administration of Latvia. Participation in the project supported by CEF, finalizing the motorways of the sea, surveying the Baltic Sea or FAMOS project. The project was coordinated by the Swedish Maritime Administration and involved 15 partners of the Baltic Sea region. The project was unique both by its scale and nature and resulted in increased maritime safety, efficiency in choosing the optimal shipping route and updated depth information that provides higher accuracy of underkeel clearance knowledge. The FAMOS project outlined the new future challenges to make the Baltic Sea one of the most modern and safest shipping areas in the world. And it also demonstrated the ability of the Baltic Sea states to agree on common goals and implement them jointly. Currently, one of the main priorities of the Latvian Ministry of Transport is working on a project how to improve port infrastructure to make it uh, the related shipping more environmentally friendly. In the upcoming months, a study will be conducted of actual market needs for the developing of LNG refueling points and development of electricity supply in the Latvian maritime port. Based on the outcomes of the study, an action plan for the development of LNG refueling points and development of electricity supply in Latvian maritime ports will be de developed. All these examples have assisted in bettering the Baltic Sea region. It is important to continue to stand together in good and bad times. Our job is to make sure what we are doing today will have an impact on everyone for years to come. Once again, thank you for having me and letting me expand on important topics like cooperation. I would also like to praise organizers for adapting to the global changes and still having a high-level forum. And as we used to say during these times, stay healthy. Thank you, Minister Linkaitz. And now time for the panel. And, and before we start, uh, start the panel, for the audience, so please be active with questions and comments. So 
that, that's a way to activate ESA as well, because otherwise he'll be only, you know, just sitting here. So he, he needs your questions and comments. And, and ESA as well, I mean, during the panel, like Bettina, if you have, if you have questions or comments or, or think of something you want to, to share with us, so please, you know, dive in. You're, you're here for the panel as well. So let's introduce the, the panelists, and I, I like with the previous names and, and the coming names, I hope you forgive me for, you know, if I at some point misspell someone's name, because we have so many different names here, so I, I try to be, you know, the, the best myself with the uh, pronunciations as well, so let's see how it goes. Anyway, Ms. Krista Mikkonen, Minister of the Environment and Climate, Finland, welcome. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you as well. G great. Mr. Christos Ekonomou, Acting Director, Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, European Commission. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome and then we have Ms. Tina Tuunala, CEO of Finnish Ship Owners Association. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Madeleine Granvik, Director, Baltic University Program. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Great, thank you. And Mr. Jonas Fegerman, Chair, Regeneration 2030 Steering Committee. Welcome to you as well. Thank you very much. Great. We have everyone online, at, at least it looks and, and seems. So let's get to business. Uh, uh, Mr. Mikkonen, the first question will be directed towards or to you. So, what are the most effective? or successful or well-functioning ways of cooperation in the Baltic Sea region? If you have sort of concrete examples, we'd be sort of glad to hear about them as well. Uh, thank you, and, and first, thank you for organizing this annual forum. It's very important, and as we have heard before, it's a cooperation and working together is the only way and the, the key that one what we can, uh, how we can uh, achieve a success. So it's very important that we have these different cooperation um, uh, methods, and, and I think, that of course, this um, EU uh, Baltic Sea strategy is a very powerful tool, but also the HELCOM is a very important uh, tool what we have. And if you look at back to the history, it's easy to see that we really have um, succeed uh, and, and making the Baltic Sea better. And I'm proud of how much work has already been done to improve uh, the Baltic Sea's environmental state. However, it's clear that we need to do more. But if I uh, mention two success stories, uh, the first is, um, is that the Baltic Sea is one of the first sea areas to reach 10% target for marine protected areas already in 2010. Even though we know by scientific evidence that 10% is not enough, we need to uh, at least 30% for effective protection areas uh, to save the marine uh, environment and global oceans, but the 10% is already a good start, and now we just need to uh, work harder. And then the other uh, important prosperity which I would like to mention is that the emissions of environmental toxins have been reduced in Baltic Sea area. The Baltic Sea has, has mostly recovered from the effects of the environmental toxin load of the 1960s and 70s, and still many of us remember how eating, for example, poultry fish was forbidden. But now, for example, the concentration of toxins DDT and PC, PCP compounds have been reduced after the use of these substances has banned, and now eating poultry fish is safe, and also the predators like sea eagles are, re are recovered. And this is a, a concrete example of what we can do when we work together and uh, with all the Baltic Sea states around the sea area. And uh, Minister Mikkonen, what do you see as, uh, what are the biggest challenges to further cooperation 
Do you see any, any sort of threats or, or things to overcome there? Uh, there's a lot of threats. The climate change is one, which is changing the environment, and we already know that the uh, um, temperature of the Baltic Sea has raised one degree. And that means that when we, when we are working to better the environmental state of the sea, we need to work even harder than what we are doing. Eutrophication uh, eut is the, the biggest problem at the moment, and that's why I'm very uh, happy that, like the Commissioner uh, uh, Sinkovic told, we had this meeting to get with environmental ministers and agriculture and fishery ministries from the EU states, because we really need to work together to make sure that we can um, decrease the nutrient runoffs uh, from the agricultural land and the land uh, around the sea. Thank you, Minister Mik uh, Mikkonen. And what about the other panelists, uh, Economo Tornala, Granvik and Fegeman? Do you see uh, with well, the same question, uh, successful, good examples of, of well-functioning ways to cooperate, and on the other hand, challenges to further uh, cooperation? Who wants to take this? Yes, Tori. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, my example would be our regional cooperation. Uh, in Finland, we have very, very close uh, cooperation between maritime cluster, and it's a collaboration between uh, ship owners, marine industries, ports, as well as authorities and universities. And uh, I think this is a unique cooperation, uh, public-private cooperation between industries and authorities too. And it's uh, I think that the basis open-minded discussions and uh, dialogue, which is very important. And we are, I would say that the, in Finland we are, we are frontrunners in sustainable shipping and the aim of the collaboration is blue growth and sustain, sustainable maritime transportation. And uh, also would like to mention the, uh, we have, that we have a quite a new cooperation platform called Fever Forward. This is together with the Swedish Maritime Cluster. So both Maritime Cluster Sweden and Finland, we are collaborating. And um, last week we had a, a webinar where Finnish and Swedish ship owners, marine industry uh, companies and ports share best practices of uh, green shipping and sustainable innovations. So, thank you. So, uh, and hey, uh, and for the rest of you, uh, just where sort of learning the best practices of, of online uh, paneling. So, so, I mean, I, I can see all of you. So if you, if you want to comment, just please raise your hand like that. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So I can see if you want to say something or just, sort of, or just sort of say it out loud. But perhaps the best thing would be if you, yes, uh, Granvik, I can see your hand. You want to comment on this, please. Uh, yes, I would like, as, as Tina, I would like to have to, to give you a present uh, an example of cooperation that, that is, in my opinion, is a very successful one. And that is the Baltic University program, uh, because it has been sustainable over such a long time, been vital for 29 years. Next year, we are really celebrating 30 years. So I think that is really great. And the Baltic University program is also uh, being a flagship within the policy area of education. And who we are. we are, we are current 88 member universities in the Baltic Sea region, in 12 countries in the, in the drainage area of the Baltic Sea region. And we are working uh, with uh, different kind of uh, sustainable, sustainable development issues uh, out from different disciplines and perspectives. And we are really encouraging uh, inter- and transdisciplinary corporations that could really contribute to the work with the Sustainable Development Goals. So the main idea with the Baltic University is to support building strong regional education and research communities. So that is what we have been working with now for 29 years in different ways by developing course materials and courses and modules and arranging students, student conferences and PhD trainings and different symposium and scientific conferences in the Baltic Sea region. 
And, and this is arranged in cooperation with, with the national centers in each of these 12 countries and also with the member universities. So this is really a teamwork, a regional teamwork, uh, over borders, over countries, over cultures, and over disciplines. And I think it, it's a really successful because we, we all have universities, we need really to work with internationalization. And this is internationalization in practice, I would say, in the Baltic Sea region. So that was one example that I could contribute with. Thank you, Madeleine Granvik. We have, it's, it seems as if we have some sort of like static disturbance in the background, but we could hear you, but there's something happening in the, in the sort of, uh, in the sound world as well, but, but I'm sure we can live with it. Uh, Mr. Ekonomou, you wanted to comment, so parakalo. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I have some problems with my screen, but I hope you can still see me. Yes, we can. Can you? Can you? Okay. Absolutely. You can still see me. All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for the invitation and particularly representing the European Commission and uh, DG Mare. I would like to highlight uh, clearly the maritime dimension of the uh, Baltic Sea strategy. And I think both the minister and previous speakers uh, really refer to the importance of maritime economy and sustainable blue growth for the region. Uh, and uh, by saying this, uh, I think the macro-regional strategy is not only maritime, uh, clearly involves much more sectors and the efforts which is made on cooperation between the different countries in the region, it's certainly much more global and addresses much more complex issues. The minister referred clearly to the cooperation uh, which is needed with agriculture. Uh, and uh, the, uh, if you want to solve uh, issues around. So uh, for your specific question uh, regarding uh, examples of cooperation, I would first like to highlight that the best example is clearly the cooperation under this macro-regional strategy. And much supporting it from the Commission side. Then, uh, clearly, Telcom itself is such a, an example of cooperation between the countries of the region. And coming more specifically to something where we as Ticimare, as Commission Service, are involved, uh, is also the Council of the Baltic Sea States. I have to say a word about this because they have a dedicated um, group looking in sustainable maritime economy. And from our side in Ditimare, we certainly uh, participate, look into the ways uh, the, uh, uh, the sustainable uh, blue economy in the Baltic Sea is uh, the perspectives that are offered, the potential of growth, and uh, from the different uh, perspectives, both from the ecosystem side, but also from the different sectors that uh, compose the, the blue economy. For instance, we co-organized with the Council of the Baltic Sea States uh, a conference on small harbors cooperation. This is also a clear example of how we can support diff with different activities, uh, different let's say, um, cooperation, uh, cooperation um, uh, to, to bring together uh, these different sectors in the Baltic and also promote uh, with concrete actions uh, the different um, fora that exist. Because I don't think you have uh, a lack of such fora. You do need to coordinate among those and the objectives are there. I think you, there are very good objectives for cooperation in the Baltic Sea, and I'm sure uh, there are ways to, to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, uh, we lost your, your picture, but, but we got the sound till the end, which is good. Uh, ju just shortly, just to, if I understood you correctly, so you want to also to emphasize, not, of course, not only cooperation within the area, but, but cooperation across areas as well. How do you see the balance between these two? Can we, can we still hear you? 
or do you hear us? Bettina, you want to comment this? Did I get this right? I mean, talk about the balance as well between cooperation across their regions and just within the Baltic region. That's, of course, two different stories. That is two different stories. Um, and and um, both, are, both are important. Mm. Of course, we have to focus on the cooperation, I think, within the region. Um, but I think there are many uh, policy areas which are looking beyond. Mm. So, so you have something to gain from cross-regional cooperation Absolutely. as well, of course, yeah. It's something to learn from other regions. Uh, oh, are we good it? at it? Or should, are we good at it? Or, or I think some areas are good at it, for some it's new, and some have not started yet. All right. Do you want to elaborate on that? No. Examples? No? <laughs> okay, any, any more comments? Please just raise your hands if you want to comment on this. Fergaman. Yeah, hello. Uh, so I just want to say for the record, I'm no longer part of uh, Vidration 2030. I'm here just as a representative of the youth of the Baltic Sea instead. Um, so. Before we get too much uh, focus on how well we're doing in the uh, region, I want to have some focus back on the things that we have not accomplished so far, even though we've, we've had a, a, both a deadline and an agenda for decades. Um, we have now the, uh, the helpful guidelines of the SDGs. Um, the issue is, though, that we are doing quite uh, horribly, honestly, on uh, several issues in the SDGs, specific mainly number 12. Um, so, which is why that when I was in Western Regeneration, uh, we focused on uh, the issues on, on the agenda, which is the UN agenda, the number 12 specifically, as the main target of the reason why we actually cooperated on something. Uh, we can, of course, just talk about uh, different ways to talk about uh, strategy and, uh, and, and uh, how we have um, collaborated across regions. Uh, for me, the most important thing is to have a a, a coherent issue that is the same for pretty much every country in the region, which is unique to us uh, because something uh, I think most people, uh, of course, consider, but uh, that I sometimes forget is how diverse the Baltic Sea region is in and of itself. We have the Nordics, we have the Baltic countries, we have some part of the continental Europe, we have Eastern Europe, we also have uh, uh, um, uh, Russia, which is a different kind of playmate to the EU. So we had a lot of different opinions on specific issues, the same issues uh, within the region, which, um, in my experience, uh, comes up with, uh, ends up being a constant uh, uh, issue when it's when it comes to actually creating and foster continuous communication portals. So. For that reason, I'm very happy that we have uh, examples like the um, uh, Council of Baltic Sea States, where they have uh, uh, exemplified again and again uh, how you can, through power management, actually have good communication across it. We in Regeneration did quite well with the, with the youth, who are a bit more open-minded, maybe, and don't see the significance of borders uh, uh, as much as we used to. We also have the Baltic, um, the Baltic University program, which has a very nice uh, um, uh, agenda to academically combine people. So, one thing I just want to say is that with the agenda and the issues being the same for each country, even though they manifest themselves differently in each nation, the biggest issue I see for us uh, and the biggest thing we can also grow from if we tackle it properly is how different we are as an, uh, uh, nations in this group, in this region, uh, compared to other regions of Europe. I think that is the biggest issue and potential good we can gain if we actually tackle that properly. That's a good point, actually, and, and uh, sort of like in comparison uh, with the Mediterranean region, of course, like the Baltic region geographically is a lot smaller, but anyway, you have a lot of sort of pluralism and diversity here as well, so I think that's a good reminder, isn't it? Any more comments on this? I can ask here in between, Esa, have we, have we got any questions already? There's uh, actually a lot of comments okay, on, great. On, on the on the and uh, good refer, uh, references and summaries of the of the keynotes and uh, and uh, panelists' uh, contribution. Uh, there's uh, and, and reminders about the about the about the concrete results and best practices that there are good showcases of those in in in, uh, in our virtual networking village. But uh, maybe uh, one one question. Uh, to the to the panelist uh, and uh, Minister Mikkonen about the what is about the role of of uh, this kind of a regional cooperation in in, in Finnish uh, environmental policies and uh, our national 
Green Deal policies, that Finland is playing an active role in the, in the EU's BSR, involved in the coordination of, uh, of, of uh, policy area uh, Nutri, fighting eutrophication, mm. and uh, strongly involved in policy area bioeconomy and innovation as well. So how, how do you see the uh, uh, role of this kind of a regional cooperation in, 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 in general environmental policy framework of, of Finland? Good question, Minister Mikkonen. Yes, thank you for the question. It's it's very important that we have it, uh, having the coordination uh, and and uh, the regional coordination and also this um, uh, coordination between the countries. And and yes, Finland is coordinating this nutria uh, together with the Poland and. The purpose of this uh, is that uh, we could uh, decrease the nutrient load to the Baltic Sea and also decrease the eutrophication, which is the biggest problem at the moment for if we think about the environmental uh, status of Baltic Sea. And it's, it's very uh, strongly linked with this um, uh, the, the HELCOM and all, also this um, Baltic Sea Action Plan uh, objectives. And I, I see it's very important that we, we are having this kind of regional cooperation, but as it, as it was mentioned before, we also need to make sure that all the countries around the Baltic Sea are sharing the same objectives, and we are working together uh, to improve the state of the Baltic Sea. And I see that at the moment there's a lot of good work going on. There's different strategies what we are doing. The HELCOM is updating its action plan. But the question is that how we can really implement all these plans, all these strategies, it, in every country around the sea. Because as, as we have seen, um, it's, uh, it's, it's easier to um, write the strategy than really do the work, what is needed. And that's why I, uh, it's very good that we have a lot of discussion, we have good of, uh, cooperation, we, we are discussing together and we are finding the measures we need to do. But the most important part is that the countries are really doing those and, and uh, uh, taking care of their part, their own part, so we can make sure that the health of our common Baltic Sea is better in future. Going back to what Fergum has said here, I mean, given the, the sort of relative smallness of the region geographically, and on the other hand, you got sort of, and of course you go back to history, you know, you know, Hanseatic tradition. So you have many sort of binding things, many things that sort of brings the Baltic states and coastlines together. But anyway, you have political realities as well. So how, how much of an obstacle do you see the, uh, the sort of realities of today in order to, to achieve this cooperation you mentioned? Uh, Minister Mikkonen. We might have, have lost her. Uh, Ekonomu at least wanted to you raise your hand, yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, actually, I don't know how much of my previous intervention uh, really uh, passed on uh, because I was disconnected indeed. And uh, I would like to say also a few words about, um, uh, first of all, the examples of cooperation and how much important it is to have common objectives as it happens under the macro-regional strategy. Uh, first of all, uh, I heard the minister referring that to the, we have many strategies, but the strategies are very often very much focused initially on national, and then when we look into the more, uh, the broader dimension, then you realize how much important it is also to coordinate with your neighbors. I will give one example which is the maritime spatial planning. I think all uh, maritime sectors are looking for space. But if you're only looking at national level, then without knowing what your neighbor does, clearly there is a, a competition and there is an obstruction to the different priorities 
that uh, the region is setting. So the Baltic states are quite good in that, I have to say, both regarding smart specialization and maritime spatial planning. We had uh, funded um, a dedicated um, project, Pan Baltic Scope Project, it is called, under the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, uh, which brought together eight maritime spatial planning authorities in seven member states, three regional organizations in the Baltic Sea region, to support implementation of the Maritime Spatial Planning, planning Directive. And this is because, as I said, if we only look at national level, we come in contradictions with what the neighbors uh, do. So this is a concrete example of how a good cooperation in the Baltic Sea can achieve much better and broader objectives than if you're looking only at the national level. Sustainable blue economy needs the broader dimension. And uh, this is what I wanted really to pass as a message uh, at this point. Thank you. And Granvik and Tornal, do you want to comment on this as well? Well, uh, not actually. No, you, 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 can, you can comment on something else as well. It's, <laughs> you know, the, the word is yours. Yeah. Yeah, so we, the, the panelists were talking about strategies and, and plans and so on. Uh, I would like to give an example of very, very practical cooperation, which is actually working very well. And uh, one of the objectives of the, the Baltic Sea strategy is saving the sea. And uh, one example of cooperation where, which is improving maritime safety is Gulf of Finland reporting system between Russia, Estonia and Finland, and where these countries and authorities are sharing information of maritime traffic, and as well as they monitor international waters and in maritime traffic and the waters. And, and this, uh, this uh, very practical cooperation between these two, three countries has actually prevented several oil accidents in the Gulf of Finland. And that's, uh, I would say that this is very uh, important cooperation and which is uh, being used in different areas. And the, another example of cooperation is uh, HELCOM, which, is what, which was already mentioned by, by other panelists. But I would like to say that it's, uh, it's also from the point of view of industry, the HELCOM is uh, a living collaboration platform. We have this, it's called HELCOM Green Team, which is a collaboration platform between authorities and industry. They're trying to uh, find solutions for sustainable shipping. And I, I definitely would like to see even more cooperation between authorities and industry, because I would say that we are all doing this together and aiming, the aims are the same, and we have different tools and same tools, but the collaboration and open dialogue between industry and authorities is vital. Thank you. Yesa, you have a, a question for the audience or from yourself? Yeah, just um, referring also to, uh, to uh, what Ms. Turnala just commented, good examples, and then uh, uh, by, by, from the audience uh, from Centrum Balticum about the, the cluster collaboration and importance of bringing public and private sector together as we are promoting, for example, clean, clean shipping in the, in the EUS PSR. But uh, what are the, we all want the private sector to be more closely involved in the, in the cooperation and in the strategy implementation. What would be the most attractive, important uh, topics or, or things to be uh, promoted or challenges to be solved from the business perspective. You mentioned that there's already good cooperation, cluster collaboration between Finland and Sweden, but uh, I, I guess it would make sense to, to, to extend that region-wide to, to provide... But between business and the public? Yes, it, it, yeah. in a cluster framework between private and public sector. But what are the business, business sector's expectations uh, Maybe especially regarding the this uh, emerging uh, clean innovation opportunities in, in shipping. 
And Esa, who would you want to uh, Ms. Tur Turnala, Turnala like, yes. especially, yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. Good question. I, I think as uh, everybody else, the, the most important issues at the moment for the industry too is sustainability and sustain sustainable shipping. And we are, of course, aiming towards carbon neutrality and zero emissions. And we, industry itself is doing a lot together with the other industry sectors, as well as I mentioned in the plastic collaboration. But of course, we need also the, the co cooperation with authorities concerning about regulation. It has to, all the regulations has to be so that it's possible to implement. So very deep dialogue is needed when preparing um, the uh, regulations, for example. And of course, uh, co-founding and financing tools to help industry to get the targets and to, to reach the targets and, and make, for example, new investments. For example, at, at the moment, we have a lot of challenges because of the COVID-19. And that's why we, at the same time, we have to find solutions how to implement the, the uh, sustainable investments. And at the same time, of course, the economical, economical situation of the companies is not very good because of the COVID-19. So there, I think they even, we need even more dialogue between authorities and politici politicians and uh, industry. Uh, and I know we are all sort of up to here with COVID, but we have to have a few words on that as well. And Bettina, you wanted to ask something, but I have a question to you as well. So my, you fire first. Um, I, I wanted to ask the rest of the panel if you have, if you could reflect a little on implementation. Now we heard from Mrs. Tornola that some very concrete uh, suggestions for how better to implement. I hear it from the panels different. Some think the implementation is, is good, others not. What are your concrete suggestions to improve implementation, to involve stakeholders such as the private se sector or other stakeholders? And we want to have very concrete examples now. Very concrete. Yes, yes, please. Who wants to take this? I'll just talk. Yes, uh, yes. So, okay, so. <laughs> okay, so coming back to the, uh, to the, um, the actual case at hand, the climate and SDGs. So um, now we've been talking about uh, um, concrete cases. I will come with up with, with some. Uh, don't worry. Uh, I would like to switch the focus back away away from just communication and platforms, back to what we have to do to actually make this work. Something that we can do, which, which is uh, uh, necessarily uh, intrinsic good uh, nature when it comes to uh, cost countries, uh, uh, countries helping each other, um, is we could start tracking our CO2 uh, collaboratively. We know that countries, they, when they track their CO2 uh, uh, footprint, they don't take into consideration imports and exports necessarily. They just ship the S2 tally to another country. Uh, we could stop doing that in the region when it comes to export, import export. We could also stop doing that in the EU. That's one thing. Uh, Second thing, the climate doesn't care about which nation stops, uh, um, lowers the CO2 emissions. The, the net benefit of CO2 emissions is just a net benefit for the climate. So if we have a higher goal in the Nordics or the Baltics, that's a good thing. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's the uh, which country leads. It just has to be a reason-wide thing to be uh, uh, higher. So instead of having like what country like Denmark, for example, are aiming to have like a 75% emission reduction, which is going to be really difficult, but it's really, really good. Uh, maybe we should collab collaborate a bit more, having like a 65% uh, effort um, in, in the region, which we could also do if we subsidize each other's uh, uh, um, uh, companies and businesses, so that we also co uh, collaborate between the, the public sphere and the business sphere and the, and the political sphere, where everybody just agrees that this is the way we have to do it, because this, it is the way we have to do it, uh, as we decided in 2015, and hopefully we still have decided that. Uh, so a way we can combine these things is we can accept that we are a, a, a region with um, uh, vast opportunities when it comes to actually collaborating across countries. When it comes to kind of counting our CO2 emissions, tracking it the right way, we can subsidize each other's uh, 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 investment when it comes to uh, renewable energies, sorry, um, and we can also um, uh, uh, have collaborative efforts between the political and the business sphere. The thing that happens in that thing, and it's been the dilemma since the, the 50s when, when we started talking about climate, is that the 
the businesses are waiting for the for the politicians to mandate change, and the bis and the politicians and politicians don't want to mandate change for the businesses. That makes it more difficult for the consumer to actually have sustainable living or having to uh, to raise the middle class. So they don't because they want to get reelected. So we have to like this stalemate where where the three spheres, the public, the political, and the business, are all waiting for each other to take the first move, and nothing's going to happen. So the thing we can do is we just take one step in each sphere at the same time and actually do something instead of having now this political political meeting where we talk about businesses should do something and then I can go next week for, for a business meeting and pe people will talk about how politicians are being lazy and not doing anything. Uh, so we could be the region, the first region in the world that, that just has this collaborative effort in all three spheres of the public uh, of the public uh, uh, eye and actually uh, get some movement when, coming, when, it, when it comes to, to doing this. Even the nature of these SDGs and necessarily mandate that these three different levels of government and uh, uh, and policies and uh, um, and business they work together from the get go and not just one and then another one and then another one. Uh, so, like I just want for the rest of this event for people to think about how one movement in one sphere necessarily changes and makes it, sure, makes, uh, it possible and necessary for another sphere to move at the same speed or even uh, faster actually. Um, I think the holistic and coherent communication across spheres in society is the only way to actually meet our agenda that we promised ourselves and the uh, other generations that we will meet by the end of 2030, which we are a long track from actually even coming close to a meeting. So yeah, that's my comment. And, and we've got the concrete examples as well. Yes. Bettina, comment on this? Um, yes, okay. No, I will comment on this later, yeah. Okay. Uh, Economo? Yes, uh, thank you. Actually, I wanted to give um, two examples of uh, uh, where I think it is important to look in cooperation between uh, public authorities, uh, regional authorities, and, and the industry. And uh, the first, it's, it's clearly a very important sector, so offshore renewable energy. I think we all talk about climate objectives, how to reach, uh, how to achieve the objectives set um, uh, for at world level and even stricter for the European uh, Union. So. It is very important to look into this very promising uh, sector where Europe is a global leader. But then, when I referred earlier to maritime spatial planning, obviously the industry has the potential, there is the, po the political will. We also have to sort out uh, the space issue, maritime spatial planning, which is so important. Uh, and um, I, I, I see that in the Baltic uh, Sea region, there are quite a lot of efforts on working together in this area. So to me, this is an example which will, it is very promising and clearly brings together and uh, this cooperation and this leadership from the political side, but also uh, the, um, uh, the technological uh, leadership from the side of the private sector to achieve uh, together the uh, climate uh, objectives. Now, the other thing, it's a, a little bit uh, coming back to the projects that are uh, really um, um, promoted through the Baltic uh, strategy. For instance, there was uh, the Baltic Blue Growth uh, flagship project, which promoted, implemented several pilot uh, muzzle farms in the Baltic Sea to explore under which biological and financial conditions this type of farming is possible. And actually, after that, as a result, three operational farms have been established, and there was a lot of production of blue mussels harvested, and it was a result of the project. So you can see how a project which starts on this strategy becomes a real business, and obviously a sustainable business model for implementation. Uh, I think I gave you to high level also, and of course, there are many, many more, but uh, I think these are, um, I think, very good to today uh, as, uh, at this point of discussion. Uh, thank you, Minister Mikkonen. Yes, thank you. Uh, I could uh, say one concrete uh, example how we can help to implement if we're talking about, for example, our uh, 
climate target or, or our uh, uh, objective to decrease the youth trafficking. We need to take care that the subsidies for agriculture, for example, for industry are helping us to achieve these targets. We, we need to make sure that we don't have a subsidy which uh, helps keeping up the fossil society or, or the subsidies which are not really pushing forward to decreasing the earth, uh, eutrophication. So the subsidies is the one tool we need to make sure that they, they are making us to the same direction that where our targets are. will at the moment to do it, do you believe? M might have problems here. Let's, Fergerman has his, raised his hands, please. Yes, I can talk forever if you want to. Sorry for that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good that <laughs> um, someone talks. <laughs> Yes, good. Okay, good. Uh, happy that finally I meet someone in my life who uh, appreciates how much to talk. It's great. I'll tell that to my mom afterwards. Uh, one thing I, I, I keep thinking about is when it comes to this, um, because when we talk subsidies, some people immediately think, oh, that's a bad word because it raises prices on things. It's an economic uh, um, uh, effect, negative effect, but it doesn't have to be like that. We have to, first of all, before we talk about growth and economic strategy, we have to talk about what is the actually the end goal of our policies, which hopefully is to combat climate crisis and save the planet. I mean, I hope that everybody is, is, is on that board. I think we are. Uh, so a way to do it, for example, if we just acknowledge that most people want to live uh, uh, sustainably and climate friendly, but not necessarily have the means to do so. And way we could do it in a cross region is we could make it a, a, a mandate shift decide to uh, take into consideration the uh, everyday worries of everyday people when it comes to their uh, inquiries on, on living more sustainably and more climate friendly. For example, um, deciding for us uh, policymakers, or you as policymakers, to, for just to say that, uh, uh, to just say we, we want people to um, travel more sustainably friendly, for example, if you talk about traffic. That could be in different ways. It could be electric bus, it could be electric metro, train, the bike, walking. I mean, anything really, just not like a diesel uh, uh, car. But re re um, subsidizing then the, uh, for example, the metro, uh, the tubes and the uh, uh, city lines, the urban traffic might make it more possible and uh, might make it more cheap for people to then go and take that kind of, of transportation. But it doesn't make every, uh, people who can't take the kind of transportation, they don't get the benefit of subsidies which means that we have a, a subsidy uh, uh, policy that does not have a holistic effect on society, which we need to actually make this uh, uh, switch, uh, um, the green switch to a more green future to, safety for, to save the climate. So I think to do instead is just say, well, what is it we don't want? Well, we don't want people to have uh, cars that uh, pollute a lot. So we'll, we just tax the cars instead of subsidizing the green thing, because then people can self decide on their own if they want to take the bike, the bus, the train, the metro, and even flying, transportation, fuck it. They can actually just do what is they need to do to get forward. So when you talk about subsidies and doing something of agriculture, the thing that 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 bothers me the, the, the immediately when people say what is agriculture is, I know that uh, what most policymakers think is we have now we have an opportunity to make our agricultural uh, and our national agriculture a more uh, uh, competitive in the, in the market, which is not the main focus when it comes to SDGs. It's not about uh, competitiveness necessarily. It is a nice bonus. If we can have growth and all save the climate, I'm all for it. If we have to sacrifice 10 years of 2% uh, growth in the GDP to save the climate, I'm even more for it. So what is it that we want to do in the first place? How can we do it, but also actually uh, uh, take people's lives into consideration if we just don't subsidize one specific part of our nation's economy to boost the economy, but we, but we subsidize or tax, if we have to, the amount, uh, the specific area in the country, in the region where we have the most pollution and where we are, where, when we are faring the, the worst, which is in our region, FTG 12. Okay, Let, let's go sort of a bit north from Denmark. Uh, Madeleine Granvik, do, do you want to comment here on something so far? You, you've been sort of off the air for us for, for 
for some time. So please, if you have something to comment. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm just, um, yes, I could make just some uh, comment about this with cooperation. Uh, within research, nowadays, it is absolutely more required from funders that we as researchers, we need to cooperate, especially when it comes to applied research. We need to cooperate interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary with other actors in society. Uh, and that is a quite new thing for researchers. And I think that is absolutely the way to go if we need to find, of course, we need to find solutions, practical solutions uh, within for, for a sustainable um, societies. Uh, so I just wanted to stress that this, this is in academia, it's, it's, it's a challenge to really work uh, truly interdisciplinary and also with other actors in society. It's a kind of new way of cooperation. Uh, and it was just when we talked about um, before about inter-cooperation within the region and, and outside the region, I just, uh, it just popped up that in the World University program, we actually have some contacts and also plans to cooperate with uh, Mediterranean uh, similar uh, program as the Baltic University program, Adrian, and that's an Adriatic and Ionian uh, Seas in initiative that was, uh, it was a, a suggestion actually from the Italian government presented as a, at the Finnish EU summit, it was in Tampere in 1999 actually. So that is a kind of similar program to us that we uh, start to to uh, cooperate and, and communicate with. So we could learn from, from another region as well within, within Europe. So that was just an example. Great. Thanks. And Bettina, I won't let you off the hook yet. I had a question for you. I'm just going back to uh, uh, sort of the Baltic region as a platform for cooperation and challenges to that because you, I mean, you're from Denmark, you live in, in, in Germany, you've been working in Latvia, you've been working in Estonia. So, I mean, you know the Baltic region as well as any. So, do, do you see, uh, I mean, a small region, but still sort of political, cultural diversity and stuff. Do, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you sort of experience the platform for cooperation? I think it's a, it's a very good platform for cooperation. And I think there's a lot have been achieved over the years. We also hear from the panelists of all these examples of, of areas where there is good cooperation. Um, we hear that the, that the strategy is a good tool, together with HELCOM, together with the sea strategies. We, we have very good tools for, for cooperation. What I hear from the panelists is we have a problem with implementation. Um, we have a problem. But lack of political courage, lack of uh, mm. money. Lack we, of I else. see. I see. I don't think it's necessarily a question of money. Money is always something which is discussed, and it's always there's always too little money. Uh, but I don't. But it's a political choice, of course. Yes. Uh, I don't always think it's 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 money. Sometimes it is coordination. Uh, sometimes it's getting money in the right place. Uh, sometimes it's it's stakeholders may, which may not have the capacity to actually get the funding. And there, there are many, it's not only a question of lack of money, and there is a lot of money out there. Um, I but, think there are other issues. Well, but is there something to, to be done about it? Yes, yeah, I think so. Yes. Um, but will you come back to that? Or, or yes, I will. Or give you yeah. the answer already now? You choose. Yeah, you give it now. Um, I hear from the, from, from the panelists that we need uh, to better involve the stakeholders. Um, and we need to make it possible for the stakeholders. We hear from, from Ms. Tornada that, that for the shipping industry to, to act better in, in this, the, we need to look at the regulations. There may also be a, a question there of financing, but it's basically a question to involve them. It, it's a question that we, we need to look at regulations. Um, then we need cross-sectoral coordination. I think we heard that from, mm. from, from several. There is a, we have now in the Baltic Sea been working a lot in the different policy areas. Now we need a, a push 
for much more cross-sectoral, uh, so that we that we do it smarter, so that we don't do one thing in one policy area which may actually have a bad effect in another policy area, or it's not coordinated. So this cross-sectoral coordination, I think, is very important. But, but, but you, you, th you, th you think we are sort of in a sort of a good starting point at the moment, yes. so it's, it's all... We are, we are getting in that achieve. direction, yeah. and I hear that also from some of the panelists. We are, we are moving in that direction, and we will actually get into that yeah. later on. Um, and I think I heard something which I think is very interesting. Uh, we, we cooperate regionally, but we still think nationally. Will we ever come you know, out of that? We need, this is, I think, the next level, mm. is that we start thinking regionally also when we implement. And, you know, being within the Baltic regions, region, it's sort of more or less effectively an EU region. So, so in that yeah. sense, of course, it's much easier than, you know, say the Mediterranean region or, or other, some other regions perhaps. Mm, is it? I, not necessarily, I would say, no. I think, by the way, I think, and I think that it's, 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 it's important that in order to implement a lot of things, we have to implement them together and we have to think regionally when we implement. Uh, I think Mr. Fairman has some good examples of this national thinking when we implement. Um, and I think that is, that is very important. And it's moving from uh, cooperation to coordination. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good sort of nuance. Difference. Hey, anyway, uh, we, we're soon running out of time, so uh, sort of parting comments, the final round of comments, and, and of course, I, I said a few, I'd like to hear a few words on how the COVID situation has affected cooperation and stuff. So if you have something on, on the pandemic as well, please put that in, in there as well. But otherwise, sort of your parting comments on, on everything we've been talking about so far, who wants to take, go first? Just raise your hand, if you're like a short round. Economo. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, I think it is uh, really the topic of the day. And uh, it's impossible to ignore the fact that, uh, I mean, we are talking about how to do things better regarding cooperation uh, while we are under a crisis. And uh, talking for the things that I know best, I mean, uh, blue economy, itself and the sectors around the blue economy I know and we know that they have been impacted heavily by the crisis and we are not out of it yet. No? So um, looking into the EU, the EU was on the front line and particularly the Commission with emergency measures to support different sectors that have been impacted, looking about to tourism, looking to fisheries, I will not enter into too much detail, but most importantly, uh, with the, under the new financial framework, uh, the recovery and resilience package, which was agreed at EU level, will provide, uh, hopefully, the necessary means for the recovery. And uh, I, I would like to insist on, on this, how much the potential of these innovative sectors can offer in the recovery efforts, both at national and regional level. We insisted how much cooperation can bring the added value, can bring the joint solutions. So also in the implementation of this new means for the recovery, I would like really to plea that people, that the national governments also cooperate when they prepare their national plans for the recovery, they should do this actually by early next year. So to look into this regional dimension, to look how uh, sectors that can bring benefit to the entire region can really be highlighted in this national plans for recovery. This is what I wanted to say, and to say that from the EU side and from the Commission side, we are following very, very closely how these plans would be implemented. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Kenamu. Hey, let's continue. A quick, just uh, passing round. Minister Mikkona, at least you, you raised your hand. You, you wanted to comment. Yes, I, I would also like to emphasize this now when we, it's time to economic recovery uh, after the COVID-19. It's very critical to make sure we do the 
recovery in a sustainable way. Because this is now a big chance uh, to us to make sure that we are building our societies greener, at uh, achieving our climate and environmental targets. So now it's, it's really time to be smart and make sure that the recovery work we are doing, we are doing in the climate-friendly and environmental-friendly way, and it helps us to also to take care of the health of our Baltic Sea. Yeah, that's good, and, and a crisis actually can act as an agent to quicker change, so that, that's on a positive note. But I think we have to leave the panel here, uh, and, and the questions and comments from the audience, I mean, the chat will be alive for several hours, even, might be even uh, after this day, we'll have to check, check on that. But anyway, so keep, keep chatting and, and discussing there, because they won't vanish anywhere. And Bettina, uh, time for your conclusion. You said already something about uh, your concluding words. Yes, I, I don't have much more than this. I think this, these are the, the main takeaways from, from, from this discussion. Um, and then here at the last round, I think we, we, we hear also that, that uh, the regional dimension of, of, of re recovery after the pandemic is, is going to be very important. And I think that links well, very well up to, um, to what we discussed before. But you got some fruits out of this. Are you encouraged? Yeah. This sound good? <laughs> yes, I'm always encouraged. That's uh, good. I think there is a lot of, of good cooperation. It can always be improved, and I think that is what is is being done all the time. Um, improving. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. And and Esa, uh, we we'll move on from here. Uh, it's good yeah. good to get the Q and A going as well. So we got a number of questions and comments. Yeah, I have to say that now at the last minutes of the of the panel, uh, a lot of Good comments, questions coming. Unfortunately, we cannot cover all of them, but please. But the chat will stay alive. Will continue so continue and please doing. actively yeah. send your questions and comments uh, also uh, in connection with the ne next panels. But there are excellent questions about, for example, how, what are the plans for, for this EU uh, recovery and resilience uh, fund? Uh, and uh, how can we maybe uh, utilize this, this regional cooperation in, in those action plans as well? And, uh, and commenting the presentation by, by Jonas Wegerman that the climate change and uh, how are we doing with SDGs, it, that's crucial. And that was a very important reminder uh, by, by, by Ms. Wegerman. And, uh, and if we don't fix these challenges, then there is no future for regional yes. cooperation. And that's why we, we need the strategy. Thank you, Esa. And, and thank you, all our distinguished panelists. It was a joy to have you, have you with us and you know, start the first plenary session with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, until the one o'clock CET, we'll have the first networking break. And during this break, please visit the virtual networking village, as well as do chat, as I said, and meet by video with the networking village's virtual uh, stand representatives, your colleagues, and new contacts, of course. In the networking village, you also find results and videos of the annual forum workshops. When we return, the second plenary will focus on emerging areas of cooperation, which was also uh, a guiding theme for the workshops. And you can find more information about the networking options in this stream and also in the annual forum websites. So see you back at 1 o'clock CET.
And welcome back to, yes, you know it already, the online 11th EUSBSR, or strategy, as we said, annual forum. Hope you had a good break, time for some refreshments, even lunch or something. And you're fully energized and back to, back to the forum. <coughs> uh, Bettina, uh, our expert co-host, and here on the other hand, we have Esa, who co-hosting co as well, taking care of the questions and the, and the answers. Uh, Bettina, our second plenary session is about to start. What were we talking about? The focus of the second plenary and panel discussion is the emerging areas and trends for the Baltic Sea cooperation and how we can make it more cross-sectoral or thematic, sharing and integrating skills and knowledge. Leading up to this forum, uh, 13 future-oriented workshops were organized in cooperation between different uh, areas and actors on a cross-sectoral basis. And these workshops covered almost all areas of the strategy. From the digitalization in ports and sea to innovation-based bioeconomy and health and well-being. With our panelists, we will discuss the emerging areas, outcomes of the workshop, and what these indicate for future joint multidisciplinary actions. Many thanks. So this is the agenda for our second plenary and, and the panel discussion. And, and, and please uh, continue sending in your questions and, and comments or whatever, and ESA will be monitoring them and we'll be going, taking as many as we can during the panel. Otherwise, until the end of the event, you, you'll be able to chat amongst yourselves and, and answer the comments and ask further questions even if we don't have time to go through them here on the stage. But anyway, if you haven't done it yet, please uh, do visit one of the virtual stands at the Network in Village to check the summary of the results and short videos recorded during the workshops. So now, before the panel, let us hear from uh, Ministers of Economy from Finland and Estonia, respectively, about emerging issues that need our collective response. So hence, we're happy to present a video message from Minister Mika Lintila, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Finland. Here it goes. Dear Chair and participants of the plenary and dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to participate in the relevant annual forum of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region and to open this second plenary on emerging areas of cooperation. It is unfortunate that because of the situation caused by COVID-19, it is not possible to meet you face to face. I wish you will have fruitful discussions throughout the day. I encourage you to be open-minded to create in finding new ideas on how we can all support cooperation in the Baltic Sea region and how to find solutions to new challenges caused by the pandemic. I believe that working together is the answer in these difficult times. The Baltic Sea is of considerable importance uh, to the countries in the region. It has major economic and international significance, and it bears great potential. In fact, the Baltic Sea economic area is very important to, be, uh, to the surrounding states in terms of trade and the commerce. When we look at various competitiveness indicators, the Baltic Sea region appears an ever stronger, ever more dynamic European region whose competencies and models of regional cooperation arouse interest elsewhere in Europe and also outside of Europe. The EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region and its recently updated action plan from a good basic for cooperation between Baltic Sea countries. The action plan provides a more concrete and therefore 
better basis for funding in which EU structural funds should be allocated more than earlier to the development of the region. At the same time, the political commitment of the countries to implement the strategy must be strengthened. The EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region has achieved a great deal during its 10 years existence, but it can do much more in the future, especially for the economic reconstruction after the pandemic. The strategy has already produced significant results, but it can help achieve even more thought commit cooperation. The Baltic Sea strategy now needs to show it can deliver, and I believe it can. With these words, I would like to thank you all for participating in this annual forum. I encourage you to work together to reach the objectives and targets to implement of the strategy, and to find new solutions and approach on cooperation in the region. I wish you an interesting plenary and a lovely autumn. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Lindila. Now let's jump across south, across the Gulf of Finland, uh, and hear our next video message from uh, Minister Tavi Aas, Minister of Economic Affairs and Infrastructure, Estonia. Dear ministers, <coughs> colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I send to you all my warmest greetings from Estonia. I am glad to join you all at the 11th Annual Forum of the EU Strategy for the Baltic Sea Region. It's my pleasure to greet you and wish you many interesting and innovative cooperation ideas in these challenging times. I would like to share with you my thoughts on real-time economy. The idea is to create a real-time business environment which administrative operations and financial uh, transactions will be created and uh, processed automatically in real time, in digital form. We, we can forget the paperwork and enterprises can focus on business growth. We sold a change the way we think. We need a change in companies and governments by applying digital technologies, including artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies. Real-time economy is already an important part of ongoing projects in the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea Region Action Plan. Firstly, we want to implement the real-time economy as a cross-sectoral and cross-border concept. Therefore, the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and public and private sector partners in the region have decided to establish the real-time economy flagship for the Baltic Sea region. Real-time economy activities are already part of Baltic Sea region countries, government action plans and Nordic Council of Ministers New Vision 2030. I am glad that uh, Nordics and Baltics have taken joint international and national steps towards real-time economy implementation. Secondly, we need to develop a joint real-time economy vision and roadmap for 2020-2027 for Baltic Sea region, considering already existing Nordic vision and roadmap. We also need to agree on common real-time economy principles to increase business-to-business -business and business-to-government data exchange. I would also like to share with you one excellent example. During COVID-19 crisis, 
We experienced high demand of reducing unnecessary human contacts in cargo collections and delivery activities. Still, about 99% of cross-border transport operations in EU involve paper-based documents. Together with Latvia, Lithuania and Poland, we have just finished testing an electronic consignment note prototype. With the prototype, it's uh, no longer necessary to stop vessels uh, for roadside check. The load documentation can be controlled from distance by just entering the truck and trailer registration number. I am happy that the tests were successful and the IDEA provided its benefits. To conclude, let's be ambitious and work towards achieving the data exchange in real time and across borders. Instead of asking different reports from companies, we should focus on sharing the data between the member states in almost real time. Thank you and stay healthy. Thank you, Minister Aas. And now let's go to our panel and introduce our distinguished panelists. Let's start with Ms. Kristina Vroblievska, General Secretary, Baltic Sea States Subregional Co operation. Let's see if we can have a picture soon back and we can sort of wave to each other. Next, next in line, the managing partner Nordic Sustainability, Morten Jastrup. Uh, Ms. Ullakari Nurm, director the Northern Dimension Partnership in Public Health and Social Well-Being. Uh, Ms. Alina, Aline Meyer, representative, uh, representative Baltic Sea Youth Platform. And Dr. Andreas Edel, executive secretary Population Europe, Max Planck Institute for Demographic <laughs> Research, Berlin, Germany. Hi, everybody. Can you see us and hear us? Yes. Just raise your hand or Perfect. something. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Hey, <clears throat> let's get, get the show going. And, and as I will be monitoring questions and comments from the audience, so please fire away on that sort of through that channel as well. And Bettina will be, you know, getting her comments and, and sort of acting as a catalyst to get things forward here on stage as well. Uh, the first question, what areas uh, or topics or issues in the Baltic Sea region would at this moment benefit from joint or cooperative actions? And what should the strategy community focus on in this regard? Or is something even overlooked? So a lot of questions, but you can pick and, and choose and let's get this first question to Ms. Vroblievska. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel too. Um, well, I would say that we can benefit from uh, really all the, from cooperation in all the spheres, but I'd like to draw our attention at this point uh, to two sectors or issues. And one would be uh, digitalization and the other one would be secular economy. And um, uh, as we know, um, uh, green and uh, digital um, uh, issues are high on the European Union agenda, and they are also high on the Baltic region agenda and in, in our strategy. Um, there are many very serious documents being implemented and announced, um, and uh, a lot has already been done and we are still uh, awaiting for, for new implementation measures and, and regulations. Um, but to, to uh, my mind and to, to according to my observation, uh, I think that we are still missing one thing. Um, because uh, in a way we are looking separately, for instance, when it comes to the digitalization, we are talking about artificial intelligence, we are talking about robotics, we are talking about um, uh, separate issues, and we in least forget about the human being in it, or do not take enough consideration for a human being in it. And so what I'm saying about it, I mean that digitalization is a kind of a perfect tool. 
um, and it can be used to both uh, good and uh, bad ends. But first of all, it has to be understood by people. And I, it's obvious that many people do not know uh, uh, what artificial intelligence is or what ro robotics is, is going to be in us, or blockchains, etc., etc. <laughs> We think it would be really of um, value and importance to bring various specialists together with people of all ages using various channels and, first of all, share the knowledge of on what it is, on where it is leading us, so that we would understand the processes and we would understand the, the challenges and know how to prepare for them. And so then it would be easier for us all to, to understand and to really implement it in a secure and efficient way. And um, in this connection, I'm thinking also of, of such issues as um, uh, digital rights or as um, being able, being aware of responsible algorithm or the issue of tracking um, and I think it is extremely important for all of, for all of us to, to really get some basic knowledge about it. And when I'm saying for all of us, I mean that it's not only the uh, older generation. We tend to think that there are native, digital natives and uh, digital islands, but then when you read some of the reports, you see that it is not so, because it's easy to to operate a smartphone, but it's not so obvious and not so automatic to be really crit critically and thoughtfully use the information flow and use uh, the technologies as to the extent that they could be used. So that would be maybe my, my first um, words about one of the issues that I think are um, really important and could, could benefit really a lot um, uh, from this cross-sectoral and cross-generational approach. Thank you, Ms. Roblevska. And, and there will be, we have plenty of time for more words as well, so that's at least sort of a consoling thought. And, uh, I, you know, you said about, talked about people business and you talked about generations and stuff, so my thoughts go to to Mr. Edel, uh, uh, you know, given the de demographic research you do, do you want to comment on this? Because mm -hmm. I, I saw you nodding at least a couple of times. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, a good thank sign for so me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the, for the kind invitation and uh, congratulate you also that you got, got together such an eminent group of, of experts and decision makers. Um, I actually very much like your, your slogan, our region, our future towards a decade of innovation and sustainability. Because um, when you look at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, um, I would say that the welfare state model, which we have in the Baltic Sea region, but also in Europe, the democratic decision making, uh, which we have, um, and, and the administrative procedures have shown that we are much better equipped than many other parts of the world to deal with such a crisis. But there are also weaknesses. And um, one of those is that we uh, discovered um, that uh, we have a lot of uh, people who are highly vulnerable. Uh, so we have seen that uh, frail old people, families with, with school kids, uh, people who are in, living in a minority situation, um, people who have to commute, people who are self-employed, we have discovered a lot of people who are highly affected by the consequences uh, of the crisis and, uh, and uh, in a very different way. Uh, the second thing is uh, that we have to see and do more research to understand uh, how we can increase resilience against uh, such a crisis uh, so that we also can enable our citizens more to, to deal with future crises of that kind. Um, another important point in research is uh, that we see an increasing level of diversity. So just look on those groups which I mentioned. If you think about the old people, you have frail old people, but you have also the so-called young old. So people who are actually well-educated, have a high social economic uh, status and are much better uh, um, equipped for, for dealing with such situations. If you look on school kids, you have school kids which are supported by home uh, at home and school kids which are not supported at home. So uh, we have a very strong diversity. To make the picture more complicated even, um, diversity is also very 
uh, there's a spatial diversity. So the situation is very different if you live in a rural, remote place, or if you live in a small city, or if you live in a big city. So also that we have to take into your garden to make it even even more complicated. It changes over time. All of you know that uh, the baby boomers are going uh, to, in the next two decades, the baby boomers will reach retirement age. So we have an increasing aging population, but we have also more mobility in Europe, I guess even more now after COVID-19, uh, in order to cover with social uh, and economic imbalances between the countries. Um, and that's, that's another important point. Uh, the diversity will not only increase, it will also be more over time and change over time. And the last thing is uh, what I want to mention is in the uh, strategy plan, in the health, uh, in the policy action on, on health, uh, which deals with, uh, with uh, uh, issues of, of demography, um, it looks a bit as if you look usually very strongly on the aging population, which is good, but we should look actually more on the life course perspective. So uh, if you want to reach active and healthy aging, actually it starts after your birth. Uh, it matters how you are educated. It matters what you achieve during your lifetime in terms of, of wealth, in terms of education, in terms of social socioeconomic status and health at the end of the day. So uh, what I would strongly advocate for is that we in this social policy area uh, put, uh, establish and uh, encourage and support more uh, comparative research and collaboration research on those aspects, on vulnerability and resilience, on changing patterns of diversity over time, over space and over the life course. And by that, even uh, make our welfare state stronger as a common narrative which we have in Europe and in the Baltic Sea States regions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edel. A uh, few good keywords there, we'll come back to those. But let's go to uh, Ms. Ulla-Karin Nurm. Uh, I guess you'd like to comment on this as well, from your point of view. Uh, yes, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to participate and to comment. Uh, from uh, our perspective, uh, we as the, uh, uh, a uh, collaboration initiative that works on health and social issues, uh, for us, definitely, if we if we talk about the uh, uh, what are the maybe overlooked in the um, uh, uh, in the USBSR, then it it is economy of well-being uh, and uh, SDGs, uh, the St sustainable development goals. Uh, in our view, it is the concept of the economy of well-being, which was the focus of the Finnish presidency of the Council of the European Union in 2019. And instead of linking prosperity with economic growth, uh, we need to aim for sustainable societies and well-being of people. And we need to link the USBSR vision and objectives closer to the SDGs so that there is a really clear link and understanding in this. And for instance, the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis uh, it has caused have clearly shown the connected of people's health to other sectors of our societies. And while good health enhances good quality of life, increases capacity for learning, strengthens families and communities, and improves workforce productivity, the policies of other areas can have a large impact on health. Um, for example, here, whatever, climate, environment and finance uh, issues. And now we experience what detrimental effects a health crisis can have on employment, educational attainment and the economy at large. And therefore, we, we believe that health should be taken into account in all policies. And during the policymaking processes of every sector, health and impact on health uh, and well-being should be evaluated. Yes. That's, of course, interesting as well. I mean, given uh, the perspective on, on health, sort of like, on one hand, lockdown measures in order to sort of save health. But on the other hand, lockdown measures will lead to things that will affect probably at some point health as well. So that's a very, very interesting and very, very important uh, sort of conflict there as well. And, and of course, it's then the rest is politics. But hey, let's get the youth platform point of view here as well. Ms. Meyer, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for having me today. Um, for us, 
of as it is especially important to include young people much more in the decision making within the USPSR. Like Willa Karin mentioned before, also young people experience these pressures that are coming with the COVID-19 crisis currently. And we had young people who ha wrote a declaration actually this weekend, and they managed to write a declaration for every policy area, what they want in these policy areas to be changed. Because we feel that the young people and their voices is often overlooked. And one thing they mentioned, for example, in the policy area health is that their health is overlooked, that they their mental health and what they are struggling with during the COVID-19 crisis is not taken serious. We have young people who uh, don't know what the future holds for them, and young people are much more affected by this crisis than many other generations. There is an insecurity in our generation, and often those who are in power don't think about that, and then they blame young people for their behavior, while this behavior is simply coming from an insecurity that this situation uh, enables or yeah fosters. So therefore, I would yeah definitely recommend reading this declaration and taking all these aspects for young people into consideration because we cannot leave one generation behind. We need young people also for a sustainable development of the EUSBSR. They will be the ones who will take up the task that the baby boomers leave. And they will be the ones who have to implement also the SDGs. And I totally agree that the SDGs have to be much more in the core of the EUSPSR. Yes, thank you very much. Very, very important points as well. And, and given that, say, a 15-year-old person uh, in the midst of the COVID crisis, let's say it takes one and a half years. So that's like 10% of that person's lifetime so far. So it's, 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 a, it's a big, big impact, of course. Uh, Morten Jastrup, uh, uh, we know you're going to talk about basically more, more on um, bioeconomy trends in the Baltic region. But anyway, if you can connect somehow to what you heard uh, earlier, sort of from a Nordic sustainability point of view. So what, what are your takeaways and, and what is your comment on this? Well, well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, first and foremost, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a good job on you for, for putting all of this together. Um, I think I can in, indeed uh, connect uh, to quite a few of the points being made so far, but just to roll back a little bit, um, I'll say that we presented a, a, a relatively new analysis of trends in the bioeconomy uh, covering an area from northwest Russia to Greenland. So it's a little bit bigger than the Baltic Sea region, but the Baltic Sea region you know, bears the, the, the brunt of the analysis there. And... and if you are asking us, you know, um, in which areas will we benefit from, from more joint and more crop action, I think it was a very strong signal, both from, from, the, uh, from the report and from the workshop that we held on it, that the bioeconomy and I might say the, the circular, the sustainable bioeconomy is an area that, that is in its infancy, but is seen as something with huge potential for value creation. And just going back to, to Ulla Karin's point on the economy of well-being, this value creation is not just economic. We, we measured the, the faith or, or the, the trust in these trends from stakeholders around the region in the value creation potential, both on an economic, on a social and environmental basis. And what it shows us is that there's a very great confidence in the bioeconomy as a means to address multiple challenges and to create a balanced growth where we are not creating just growth for the sake of financial growth on the expense of, of other areas of society and, and the planet, but where we are creating a growth that is more balanced between society, people, uh, society, uh, profit and, and uh, uh, the planet. Sorry, I forgot that one. Um, of course, that, that has... Um, also, of course, indications into to, uh, to what Andreas talked about on, on resilience. It's, it's very much part of that, too. Um, 
So and 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 even you know one of the trends was or, or one of the, the points being being made was that bioeconomy uh, by many are seen as a means to create good jobs, you know, interesting, uh, high value jobs, also in the rural areas and jobs for the younger people, for the ones who do not necessarily wish to migrate to the cities, but actually likes living by the sea or by the forests uh, or in the countryside. Um, but still, of course, would like to have a promising career ahead of them and, and see themselves grow and flourish as persons there. So, so if I were to, to sum up on this and see which are the areas where we would benefit from, from cooperative action, I think the bioeconomy, the sustainable bioeconomy, is, is very much one of these areas. It's still in its infancy. So initiatives to connect and support, uh, develop uh, stakeholders and scale sustainable bioeconomy solutions and initiatives are worthwhile looking into. Hey, and, and um, for the rest of the panel, so if you, because I can see you, and I hope you can see all me as well, so if, if you want to comment on something, if you want to, to say something, please raise your hand. Right hand or left hand? <laughs> Just raise your hand I can, so I can see it, and then I know you want to, to say something, and, and that's the easiest way for me to connect to you then. But hey, uh, Andreas Edel, I, uh, I want to go back to, and Morten, you talked about resilience as well. Uh, and w which I think is a very, very important word. So like, you know, bend, 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 but not break, like a strong, fresh twig on a tree. So given the COVID situation we now have, have, have and, and looking at the Baltic Sea region, uh, how do you think, uh, how, have, how, how have we fared resilience-wise? Because we know if resilience breaks, that will lead to a lot of, you know, political troubles, all sorts of other troubles as well. So, uh, how have we done well? Hmm. I would say um, uh, there's not an easy answer on that issue because, oh, there's a, there's an echo, I guess. Okay, uh, there, there's not that, that easy answer because it's 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 really it depends a lot. As I as I mentioned, you have um, in any uh, age group, in any population group, you have so much diversity now uh, between the people. Uh, just if you look in the economy, there are some people who have really done well during the uh, COVID-19 crisis in the self-employment sectors and others for, the, for them it was a disaster. Um, uh, you have um, uh, people who, let's say, uh, can, can work from home and people who cannot do that. And you have also um, an issue with um, um, the new normal uh, home office uh, and homeschooling. Um, for some people, that's a very good solution. Uh, for other people, it's a disaster because they have to commute. They are not anymore in their social communities. Um, they uh, are exposed, of course, if they use the public transport to more uh, more uh, risks and so on. So the, the picture is very, very very much um, different uh, uh, and we need much, much more research on that. And that's also another reason why it's so hard to give you a clear answer. Um, when the COVID-19 crisis um, uh, started, uh, we had a lot of uh, ad hoc advices, um, which were often driven not by sufficient data. Um, and we have to say more clearly that for the future and for future crises like that and for understanding more about the vulnerable populations, and to create more resilience, we should uh, get prepared to have uh, a much better data infrastructure. A lot of advice which we have to give uh, in the very start of the epidemic was given on not so good evidence, and it was not uh, uh, there were, was no evidence available uh, to clearly say which group might be strongest affected um, by the economic uh, uh, outcomes and consequences of the crisis. Morten, you want to comment? Thank you. I, I think I, I want to offer an environmental perspective uh, on, on what Andreas said on, on resilience. I think from an environmental point of view, um, we haven't really done well <laughs> in this region when we look at, at how we have maintained or built resilience. Quite the opposite. You know, I think um, from a relatively early industrialization, also industrialization of the rural areas and, and very high focus on monocultures, both in, in agriculture and forestry, and also some extent in, in aquaculture. Of course, that is, that is very much the antithesis of, of a resilient and thriving uh, uh, 
biosystem or ecosystem. I think perhaps though we 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 might see signs of of slowly bouncing back on more focus being given politically uh, on biodiversity, also in the practices in in both uh, uh, farming and and forestry. Uh, there are indeed some people talking, starting talking about rewilding in, in some areas too. So I think we have, during the 20th century, really, you know, from, a, from an environmental point of view, we have thinned out our resilience quite a lot. But you could hope that we are, we are slowly bouncing back, at least let's, let's focus on it, whether or not it will be enough to handle the Know, the ongoing growth and, and encroachment by, by, by people on nature is, is hard to say, but at least as we're talking about it now. Okay. Hey, sorry, I just noticed I'm sometimes using only first names, but you know, we Nordic people are very <laughs> informal first name basis people, so excuse, I, I try to, I think we should go with surnames all the time, that's a good standard, but if I only use first names that sometimes, so just forgive me. Ullakari Norum, please, you wanted to comment. Yes, thank you. I'm very fine with calling me Ulla Karin. Um, I, I wanted to comment on this resilience that um, uh, all the countries do have their crisis uh, plans and, and prepare for crisis and risk communication. But in the times of the current pandemic, um, what we have seen, uh, that many countries turning uh, inwards and prioritizing their own interests. And that is, a, uh, that is an issue. I think that is a... Uh, a problem that we need to talk and discuss and, and really prepare a better for the uh, for the second wave or, or for the future. Uh, because cooperating in times of crisis is uh, for the benefit of everyone. Uh, 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 viruses, uh, bacteria, uh, they don't respect borders. And uh, we really need to be um, uh, putting a lot more effort in, in the cooperation even if the time is scarce, uh, people are overloaded and overburdened. We now see greater collaboration and interaction between countries, but there is still this kind of competition uh, that, you know, who is doing better and who is, uh, whose numbers are, are worse, and, and uh, especially um, being placed in, in, in Stockholm, we, we, we are kind of hearing and seeing it a lot, the comparison uh, between the strategies. Instead of this, we should do, uh, we should collaborate and have also the communication towards our our population uh, that is tailored and that is coordinated. Um, and also uh, one other uh, moment, which was also touched with Alina, is the mental health issues. We prepare for uh, dealing with infectious disease and also with the, uh, with the um, uh, complications, uh, but we forget actually that it has a great impact on mental health uh, and especially young people who are very affected and young people, uh, students and, and um, high school uh, students who are uh, working remotely and studying remotely. I think this is a, a uh, population group uh, who has somehow been neglected. Uh, we talk about older people and maybe young children, but we have neglected some, some groups. Yes. Uh, a few, few Thank sentences. You. Uh, you're saying that germs and, and viruses and stuff don't respect national borders, but on the other hand, we saw some might call them like knee-jerk reactions as well. I mean, we, we sort of, countries wanted to close their own borders and so sort of like as perhaps a knee jerk uh, reaction goes sort of back to national thinking. So, what, what do you say about that? Yeah, exactly. That was reactive. That was a very much reactive uh, action. So, there was no coordination in closing those borders because, in some instances, in the very beginning of the pandemic, closing of the borders really didn't make sense. There were other things that should have been uh, coordinated. And closing of the borders also had impact on, uh, on uh, uh, logistics and transport of uh, protective uh, gear and, uh, and medicines. And even in some instances, there was an issue with uh, uh, sustaining uh, to provide clean water because of the chemicals of uh, cleaning the water didn't arrive in time. So there are th those kind of things are all... It is a very complex uh, thing, 
uh, when we deal with a crisis like this. And uh, we, we need to put a lot of effort uh, for learning all the lessons uh, uh, for yeah. the future. Yeah, you have a good point. Uh, perhaps exactly, perhaps get rid of, of unnecessary primitive reactions, if I, if I uh, interpret <laughs> you correctly. Uh, Morten, and then we'll take comments from the studio as well. Morten, uh, yes, I'll, I'll try to make this short. I, sorry. I'll try to make this short. I, I, I very much agree that, that in the face of a crisis like this, we really need collaboration and we need to work together much more. Um, the analysis we did of the trends in the bioeconomy was based on the survey, and we just had time to get out a short extra survey asking about uh, what impact uh, the COVID-19 would have uh, from the respondents, what, what impact they believed the COVID-19 pandemic would have on the development of the bioeconomy. And the interesting thing was that what we saw was that respondents in that extra survey, they said that the emergence of the COVID-19 and the co coronavirus has even stressed even harder the need to develop a bioeconomy. And we interpret that into the terms of, of stakeholders seeing this as part of that you know, shortening of value chains that we're talking about. Is that happening right now with globalization? Are we in a situation where this also this virus hits us so hard on our economics because our economics have become perhaps a little bit too intertwined. When we talk about resilience, you often talk about the, the systems perspective and you have flows and stocks. And and globalization have really made it made us really good at shifting things around and having things flowing all the time and it creates great efficiencies. But we haven't built our stocks. And from a natural system no, having much depletes the stocks. Um, and that's perhaps a little bit of that kind of reaction that, that, that from some perspectives, it might be good to be just a have a little bit more in stock and a little bit less flowing. And you see that happening right now, of course, on, on personal protection gear. You also see that happening on yep. uh, needles and, and vaccines and so on. The countries are looking into building stocks to build resilience and I think we see some companies starting to, to think about, can we perhaps shorten our value chains so our risk uh, in a situation like this doesn't have to you know, take into account the whole world, but could perhaps take into account two or three regions. Yeah, that's a good point to so revamp on, on logistics as well. And that, that, that is something the COVID will definitely do as well. And hey, yeah, before we take to the studio, uh, Aline Maya. I, I, I think I saw your hand up in the air as well. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Fire away. Yeah. I, I think I agree fully with Bula Karin on many points. And from a youth perspective, we should really see this crisis as a burning class to see our problems and not to tackle them in the same way we did in history, but to look forward and to use these means that we have now, the digitalization and other means, also to think about other ways how to uh, um, develop our economy. We don't really need to go on like this. We saw that change can happen in a few weeks, in a few days, and even in hours. So I think we really should think about how to change our region and how to make collaboration possible also in the future. For us, our younger generation, mobility is an important point here as well. We are not able to travel at the moment. We are not able to go on exchange. And that's a huge problem for a young generation. And it's a huge problem for our region in the future, because if we don't know each other, if we didn't get in touch with each other, there is no such thing as our region. So we have to build these new means and these digital means, and we have to use them to really collaborate within our region and to think forward instead of thinking about what we maybe did wrong in the past. We need to think about our future, and that is what we should do now. Yes, th thank you very much. And, and, and we can't do it online all the time. We need, we need, we need to go back to <laughs> physical context at some point. And, but the thing is, on the other hand, like all crises throughout world history, they will always be a catalyst for positive change as well. So there is a chance to, of course, clean, clean the slate 
as much as the slate needs cleaning. Bettina, I will surprise you now with questions, your comments. I've seen your, your pen uh, smoking because you've been taking a lot of notes. So what are your, your first thoughts? Um, I think a lot of very good points. Um, I think all the very good analysis on what went wrong and what we have to do something about. Um, I think I will go in the direction of Eileen Meyer, who was, who was much more concrete in saying, what can we do? How can we do it? Uh, and I would pose that question to the panel and say, what can we do? What can we concretely do? What can we do about data together? Let's get a short round, quick round. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you confused me. Now you confused me. <laughs> I didn't know that I was. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with our young colleague that that uh, the young generation is now really harmed uh, by getting less less mobile. On the other side. And also that we have these kind of uh, closing borders and so on. Um, but on the other side, I'm not so pessimistic. First of all, uh, if you look on my country, Germany, uh, we are even now thinking about closing cities uh, like Berlin, which has a high rate, uh, some parts of the Alps, uh, which have a high rate. So it's not national stuff. It's more uh, something which relates to um, getting things under control. Uh, and on the other side, we have an interaction between the federal and the, the provincial governments. And the same was true for Europe. So we do actually not that bad in, in terms of managing the crisis, much better than some other uh, presidents in the world do. Um, the other thing is um, that uh, I see the point that mobility is, is, is really uh, reduced, um, but I was amazed about the speed, how we developed all these Zoom conferences and all these tools so that we really got online uh, very, very rapidly. And we have now a lot of meetings every day, two or three of them, uh, where you can join all over the world, from the Global South, from other parts of the Atlantic, uh, to, to discuss recent issues. I would be not that much um, skeptic because I guess uh, when a vaccination should come into force and when we can get to normal mobility standards, uh, then we can, of course, have a much better exchange. On the other side, um, we will, I guess, stay with uh, keeping these online formats, which are to some extent very effective. And by the way, they are also good for the, for the environment. So um, I absolutely agree it's a bad situation, but I think we handle it not that badly. Next. Yes, Aline. Yeah, I think I wouldn't be pessimistic at all, actually. I would use this chance to really build a new society and really go forward with these digital means. Like, I don't think we, like, as I said, we, we saw that everything can change immediately. And so if we use these digital means, then we can really build our region and we can make it a more resilient region for the future. Because currently we are really a lot about going back to normal. But do we really want to go back to this normal that we had? Or do we want to use this crisis and go, go forward into a future that is even better than the what the past we had. I think this is what we should do. And we should work with more digital means in the future. We should work with other parts that we saw now that work in, in this crisis. We should maybe also, uh, yeah, have a better health system together. And we should talk about, do we need to close borders? Do we really need to close borders if such a crisis occurs again? In my opinion, we don't. I am also a German citizen and I think, and I'm living in Sweden and from my personal perspective, Sweden is not doing badly at the moment. It is for me personally, like mentally, it's a, it's a vacation to be here. And it was really, really hard for me to be in Germany the first six months of this crisis. And I wouldn't say that Germany did super well on the mental health part. They they are doing well on the cases, but the mental health, especially of young people, is often overlooked by politicians in Germany. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good point. I mean, you have, you see, of course, trade-offs all over the place. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing, of course, and it's very much then, of course, 
po you know, political decisions, 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 what you want to emphasize. But, but a very good point. And, and, and Aline, at least what, if I can promise you one thing, it is that we'll, we're never going back. Not all the way, at least. So this, this crisis will take us forward, for better or for worse. Let's hope for better. We're not going back anyway. But uh, Morten, you wanted to comment first, and then Andreas, and then Ulla Kari as well. Uh, Morten, I, w sorry, I, we can't hear you. Can you please check your line? We can't hear you now. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry, yes. I hope it's better you're, now. You're back, yes. I just want to say that I'm fully on the team with Alina Meyer here. No, I don't want to go back to normal. Uh, it wasn't such a great place in many ways from a mental health perspective even before. Um, I think what we have seen... I also I like Andreas's point there um, on how data allows us to manage things more delicately, more granularly, uh, meaning that, that we are also pretty fast learners in, in, in spite of this very, very dire situation. Now we are, as he said, now learning to shut down regions, cities, smaller areas, because we, we have the data and we have been good enough at learning, driven also by data, uh, uh, on how to manage this on a more delicate level. Um, I think from the perspective of, of you know, what's a new normal then going to be? I know, you know from just our little world, our little office, we instituted that you no, know, we don't have five days in the office anymore. We actually liked quite a lot of working from home, many of us. So we have four days in the office now. Um, also the point on, on meetings, meetings are more efficient, often shorter, faster to call. Um, the downside is that I have around, I think I have twice as many meetings as I used to be. So there's a little bit of meeting fatigue, perhaps also uh, kicking in there. But, but um, all in all, I think, you know, um, from a very personal perspective, uh, at least work life in many ways is not worse off and will not be worse off. And I think we, we will learn to manage uh, this even better. And I think this event as well, we wouldn't be here for only six hours physically, we'd be here for nine hours or two days or something. So all the events are shorter as well nowadays with the, with the online stuff. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, hey, okay, let's say, Kristina Rublievska, let's go to you. you. You've been so like off the hook for a while, so please uh, do comment. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I would like to definitely uh, support and follow what Alin has said um, that we should do our best to really make the best use of the of the experience that uh, we are going through now. Um, uh, but I would definitely um, think, and not as a specialist, but as a as a citizen uh, and as a human being, that what we need uh, is much more knowledge of um, uh, the processes and what influences us when using the digital world or when being in the digital world. And I think it will be important for us all to also in our exchange and cooperation you know, to know those mechanisms uh, which are behind the information flow and about the cho choices that are influenced because in this way, we, we will avoid uh, being steered and also be more conscious of our decisions and of, of our um, functions. And I think it is important both when it comes to um, uh, democracy building and to the relation building, uh, etc. And talking about the fact that we are now uh, maybe more efficient using the, the uh, digital tools, I would absolutely agree with what has been said till now. I'm only afraid of, of the thing um, that we could call the society disruption. Because I think that without uh, direct meetings and socializing, we are losing a very important side of our life. So let's hope that we will not come back to, let's say, normal, but that we will go out of this, uh, those dire times uh, using to the best what we have now, but also being then able to rebuild the society, which is, I think, being disrupted. Yes, thank you very much. Hey, let's take uh, Ulla Karin and Andreas, and they will uh, turn to Esa here in the studio and see whether we've had any new questions or comments. But Ulla Karin, Palun. 
Yes, thank you, Dan. The uh, I, I just want to build on what all the previous uh, speakers has have already told. I I, I can't agree more. Um, that uh, and there has been very many uh, very many positive uh, things happening, or if we can call it healthy dose of disruption to the society. For instance, from the healthcare sector, uh, uh, a thing uh, which is uh, establishing remote services. And uh, phone uh, consultations are, and remote consultations, um, which is a, a particular is issue in the nor uh, northern dimension region, uh, region in the Nordic countries, where the uh, distances are, 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 are far and the uh, population is sparse. Uh, this happened like, uh, you know, from a single click of a finger. Uh, the developments were there, but there were a lot of barriers why this couldn't be implemented before. And now it all happened. The same with the with the with the digital um, uh, online meetings, and also the uh, uh, work life balance has benefited uh, because people don't spend so much time in the traffic. Uh, getting to work and getting off work, and they can also uh, maybe uh, the uh, in, at some point the physical activity has decreased. But if people are knowledgeable and aware, it uh, it can be uh, in the from this better side. So there are a lot of a uh, lot of um, benefits from this uh, disruption of the society. We just need to. Uh, make sure that we keep the these positive things and we elaborate on the uh, on the lessons learned as i as i said before uh, and also maybe uh, the positive thing is that uh, it has filtered out unnecessary uh, in our society maybe some unnecessary jobs some un unnecessary movements uh, and unnecessary elements in our life I used to be an Estonian with Ylökarin, so I, I, I go with Andreas, say, Die Bühne gehört Ihnen. You can have the last comment now before the, uh, before the questions and answers. I would, I would, I would like to, to come back to one important point which was made in, in, in all the contributions now, uh, particularly from Aline, uh, is uh, the mental health, health issue. Uh, this affects, of course, also elderly, lonely people. Um, people who are uh, living in a, in a uh, complicated life environment or isolated uh, minorities, whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, groups in our population which might be affected by um, uh, mental health issues. And there's a, a bulk of research, of course, on that. Again, the bad thing is that we still don't know enough uh, from the service. And that's uh, one demand which I would have to, to uh, get uh, better prepared for future crisis, is to en enhance more the research cooperation in terms of, of data infrastructures. We have great surveys like the Generation Gender Survey, like the Survey on Health, Aging and uh, um, uh, Survey on Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe, the European Social Sur uh, Service. So we have great service, um, but we should link them more with register data, which we have a bit better access in the Nordic countries than in, a, in, in the other countries. And of course, we have the big new group of, of social media data and, and digital trace data. And it's a very exciting field of research uh, on the one hand side to bring this data together to match it. And on the other hand side, to see all these outcomes, uh, which we should know much, much more about for the next crisis, in particular to protect the younger people, the isolated people, the people who are really in demand uh, of our protection. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Hey, Esa, uh, any questions or comments or anything else? Yeah, uh, there's. Is there a buzz? A lot of, lot of, lot of comments, and especially a lot of credit given given to uh, to this uh, youth uh, perspective that uh, and uh, and a lot of uh, warm welcomes uh, for for this uh, youth declaration by by BSR Youth Platform presented here represented here by Alin Meyer. Uh, but then, uh, so, so Aline is winning over hearts and minds. Here. Yes, that's, and, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a valid, valid and very important point. Also, as a representative of the of the strategy and one of the policy areas, that's something that uh, we need to pay increasingly attention to. How can we engage better young generation in in yeah. the activities? And that's very very important. Then the question to all the panelists: uh, uh, What are the most important actions? which may contribute to building a more inclusive society and economy, which is better fitting to the needs of the vast majority of, of people. So about inclusion, what kind of uh, mm. actions would be important in the, in the, for example, in the Baltic Sea cooperation? Yeah. Mm. Comments 
requested from all the panelists. And actually, hey, just sort of, we have like something like 15 minutes left, so of course uh, not everyone has to comment on anything, but, but please raise your arm if you want to comment on, on what you heard Esa say. Well, let's take Aline first and then Andreas and then Christina. <laughs> okay. Uh, so from our perspective, of course, much more inclusion of the normal people, the citizens. We as young people, we don't only want to be included as young people, but we also want to be the access for other minorities to be part, for example, in the USBSR, because currently it's a really privileged area where a lot of people who already know each other work together and it's not really visible to the citizens of our region what is what has been done within the strategy. So I think including local communities much more. And going to them, really going out of this bubble, going out of the silos and really approaching the normal society, the everyday people, those people we meet on the street and talk to them and ask them also what are their needs. That is not more needed in this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Andreas and Christina. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw, if I'm not completely mistaken, uh, that the EU strategy actually also includes uh, the term of co-creation. And this is something which I really can only very strongly support also in the future. So we had this year an experience. We wanted to see how communities, uh, municipalities, rural regions uh, react to social, to demographic change. Uh, so if we, if we invited really the majors, the mayors, the uh, NGOs, and so on from the local scene, plus uh, policymakers, plus uh, people from societal organizations, and particularly also the young people, and wanted to learn more about uh, how can we make uh, a rural environment uh, in a great in a way that the young people, young families, um, and old age people as well uh, find can can live there. And uh, the method was the most exciting one because uh, we really had those groups around and researchers presented evidence. We, as researchers, learn from, from the people on the spot what is really urging for them and what are the, the things which we should, should tackle. And the other way around, many mayors said, well, I didn't understand, know that the young people think like that, as you can tell me from your surveys. So I think that should be really something you, which you should, should enhance in, in, in these strategies is this kind of cooperative, uh, co-creative uh, models of, of uh, creating new knowledge. Thanks, and Christina. <clears throat> well, um, when talk, now, now I'm talking about the beautiful in person because I'm here as such and with this flag behind me. And uh, we in the beautiful SC, we've been really about the um, including the young generation, and we've been doing that for quite many years now. And um, one of the forms we are doing that is the young people having their network, have their representatives permanently on our board meetings, where we discuss together, uh, including young people, issues important for all of us in the Baltic Sea area, and especially for, for um, uh, young people. Whenever we organize our events, like uh, last month's annual conference, we also have, um, on one hand, special even for people where they discuss issues which are then being dealt during the uh, annual conference. But it is not two separate events, but the young people bring from what they had learned and discussed at their event to the general conference where they share um, their conclusions and their expectations, etc. And so what I have been repeating several times now at different, um, on different occasions is that uh, this cooperation has also shown that dreams come true because the, uh, we are happy now uh, to have this Baltic Sea Youth platform. And this was a dream um, that came, um, uh, w that was born during one of the BCCC youth events. So uh, we, we are a platform, or one of the platforms which makes those dreams uh, happen. And I hope it will continue this way. Great, thank you for those words. You, Lakarin, you, you wanted to comment as well. Yes, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to bring in uh, a, a bit of a new topic um, going away from this COVID. 
and and uh, and talk about one of the examples uh, as a policy area coordinator how we are trying to set the strategic agenda in a different uh, in a different way uh, uh, and uh, trying to um, uh, involve uh, different stakeholders and uh, as uh, uh, again referring to what Aline said that it's very important to uh, reach out to the local level and to the civil society and regional initiatives and and uh, here we have initiated a um, uh, a new uh, arena uh, collaborating with the arts and uh, culture sector and with creative industries and during the uh, we uh, we had the joint workshop alongside this annual forum um, uh, and the topic was impact of arts and culture on health and well-being and um, it's uh, participating in culture and artistic activities shows very promising health promoting effects in people of all ages. And uh, we are trying to find ways how to use this potential in our health and social systems. And especially uh, there are effects on mental health. But we also have realized that both sectors, health and culture, work in silos uh, and we don't have always uh, the same language uh, and we, we, we don't work maybe even on the same dimensions. Uh, so our future work on this topic will therefore um, uh, uh, focus on finding uh, ways to connect the two sectors better. And of course, um, the USBSR provides us this as platform. Um, and uh, as an outcome of this workshop, we were, we were proud and really, it was very interesting to see how many different participants we had. Uh, it was uh, much beyond our expectation. Uh, so there is um, uh, a lot to do and a great insight into, uh, into this in the future. Great. Hey, and actually, anyone else uh, participating in one of the workshops or the forum? Morten? Yes. Yes. Yes, we had we had uh, we had the workshop called the Sustainable Bioeconomy Trends and Value Chain Opportunities. Uh, we presented um, the report we did, uh, and and other work was also presented there. We had quite a good discussion there, and I think actually some points from that discussion can also be used to to perhaps answer your last questions on on how should we how should we work? What, what is it that the EU SBSR should do to create this in, inclusive society that that we're hoping to foster? Um, because from from the perspective of what we were working with, the bioeconomy, it was very clear that there's so much going on, that there's so many interesting things happening right now. Uh, new technologies, digitalization is a great enabler, actually. Um, new markets, new products coming out, uh, but still, uh, new business models also, but still, uh, a lot of these initiatives are unconnected, or at least not connected well enough to be able to create synergies. So so it was very obvious, I think, from, from that workshop, and I had a really, really great discussion there, um, that initiatives to try and, and connect stakeholders and, and actors in this field could actually be a big boost because the underlying or, or the, the, the really great barrier, you might say, for this bioeconomy that everyone there was know, convinced of has such great potential. The really great barrier is that it's such a huge shift and who's taking the first step? Who is the main driver here? It's not obvious who's doing it. But I think as we've been discussing right now, the situation that we are in right now, where we have seen that, you know, things can, under enough pressure, things can happen really, really fast. Yeah. Uh, is a very good chance for us to say, how then do we, actually try and perhaps generate some of the same kind of momentum into handling some of the bigger crises or longer lasting crises that we are seeing out there that we're already experiencing here from climate, from biodiversity and, and other areas. So I think my, my concluding words from that is that you know, we have actually an opportunity right now because the lid is off. We just want to make certain that we don't waste this crisis. You know, we want to make certain that the, 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 impetus for change that it has shown and, and the capacity for change that it has shown, that we can also perhaps divert this or generate it again uh, to tackle some of the, uh, of the challenges ahead.
Yeah, and of course, one can't resist thinking about applying all this on, on an EU level as well. I mean, I mean now, now it's a, Definitely. Definitely. a moment to drive forward, I mean, given the circumstances and stuff. But uh, Aline, at least, you wanted to comment. Yes. Yeah, also, just from a youth perspective, I think one thing that the USPSR should also do is fund smaller projects. I know there was one workshop organized by Vietcher, that was also asking for cultural actors, because they are also very much affected by the crisis, to give them some smaller funding that they can implement local activities. So this is something really concrete that we should start with. That is something that we would need in the Baltic Sea region. Microfunding for smaller projects, and not only thinking of these bigger projects, Horizon 2020 and such, but really start on a local level and there is the place where change can happen. Hey, uh, thank you. And Andreas and Christina, hang on a second. We might run out of time. I'll check with Esa. Esa, have we got any questions, comments, anything you want to share with us? Just a referring, just maybe a quick comment may be requested from uh, Christina as you are representing uh, uh, this um, uh, regional and local level. And uh, as we were earlier discussing about this uh, increased nationalism, an inward-looking uh, attitude as a one challenge caused by the COVID crisis. And it was just, uh, just a couple of years ago when we talked about this century as a century of cities. And uh, now it, there's a, we are experiencing this kind of re-emergence, new emergence of nation states. So, Christina, uh, uh, we, we know that cities and regions have been among the most active stakeholders in EUS BSR and BSR cooperation. So how, how do you think, that what is their role, very briefly, that what is a local and regional respond, response to this uh, bit new situation that we, yeah. we have? Christina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think you have touched a very, of the, the, the question has touched a very important issue and one of the biggest challenges now. And um, the place where I'm coming originally from is one of the best examples of that. And I think that the b biggest role of, of um, cities, regions, and social um, and civil society, including youth, is that we really cooperate pragmatically. We meet and solve concrete things, and not and, and on, while on the central level, it is more often politics, which which can be more instrumental in creating those nationals, etc. So I would say that the biggest uh, role of, of, of uh, local and regional cooperation would be continue meeting, continue solving issues together, no matter what country we are from, no matter what cultural background we are from. And here I would definitely support what Eileen has said and what has been the expectation of the youth. We do need a lot of bottom-up contacts and people-to-people -people and small and easy projects because uh, we have to continue meeting and getting to know each other and learning how to solve problems. It's a great uh, way to, great words to end the panel with. I would love to have, you know, love to keep going on with you. Very good thinking, very great, you know, great, enlightening, inspiring words and stuff. But time is running out. Bettina, your closing comments. What do you want to add? I don't want to add anything. Uh, I think I would want to pick up from, from these very good uh, inputs from our panelists. I think it was, the, it was very, very good. What I take away from here is... Um, not back to normal, at least not the normal that we knew. Yeah. What can we learn from this crisis? How can we involve stakeholders of all sorts? Um, and how can we actually use the strategy? How can we use the EUSBSR to implement a new normal? What is it that is it? Um, can we use the EUSBSR as a connector, a synergy between different areas. What can we use it for? I think this is a, I will leave it there. Um, and, and fast forward, we have the leverage now. Yes. Driven by, by, by what's happened. Yeah. Exactly, by sort of necessity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Christina Vroblievska, uh, Morten Jastrup, Ylakarin Nurm, Aline Meyer and Andreas Edel. Thank you very much for participating.
So uh, that's the end of, of our uh, second part. And now let's go to our second networking break. If you didn't have a chance during the last break or want to explore some more, please visit the virtual networking village as well as chat and meet by video with the networking village's virtual stand. And let's see where we are here. Uh, yes, sorry, with the networking uh, villages, virtual stand representatives, your colleagues and new contacts. And we'll come back to the live stream in about 45 minutes, so see you then.
Bettina, they say third time lucky, but I think we've been lucky so far with you know, great panels and, and great cont contributions to this event. And now, anyway, the third part, the final part of our event is about to start. So, Bettina, what will the third part be all about? Before I, I say that, I will just recap very quickly. Our first plenary looked at our current experiences um, and what we have developed over the last 10 years, what type of cooperation delivers result in the Baltic Sea region. The second panel, we looked into current and emerging opportunities for cooperation. We heard a lot of interesting things about cross-sectoral and the possibility of involving many more stakeholders. And therefore, this last plenary and panel debate will look into the future. What are the policies and strategies that will shape the cooperation in the Baltic Sea region in the years ahead? First, we will look hear about the updated EUS BSR action plan, as well as the BSR program and its future priorities. And then we hope that our panelists will share with us details on how specific global EU and regional policies will shape cooperation in specific areas. And lastly, we will also look at the very important aspect of macro-regional joint actions with neighboring countries. And we will discuss this with experts from these. Sounds good. And that's then the full package. That's the full package. That's it. And we, we, we're sort of supposed to be able to, to get things forward uh, on the basis of these sort of three parts of input, ideas and, and shared thoughts and, and others. Uh, before we go to the panel, and before I introduce the panelists, let's have a keynote and let's welcome Norman Spopens, Deputy Director General, Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy in the European Commission. Welcome. It's all yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me. You know, I would have preferred to be in your beautiful city in Finland, but it's not possible. So uh, let's try to do the best we can. And um, I'm very thank thankful to you that you made this possible through these different virtual means. I have to say that I'm hearing my voice as an echo. So I well, try we can to hear adjust. you just fine. <laughs> Okay, so I will try to ignore my echo. Now it's much better. You can still hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Good. So I, thank you, and, and I liked your, your introduction, uh, talking about future. Um, it's, I think, the way we should approach uh, today is to think about future, because uh, without future, there is nothing, right? And these are unprecedented times that we are going through uh, with the coronavirus crisis. I think it had put under question a lot of uh, basics that we were taken for granted. Um, I, I want to say in the beginning that obviously as a European Commission uh, and together with member states and uh, everyone involved in our program implementation, uh, it has been our key task to make sure that whatever funds we have available and whatever needs there are emerging in this very difficult situation that we channel our funds to those needs. And this is why you must have noticed that uh, we have gone through a, a major exercise of uh, uh, relaxing in certain sense the rules for our programs or enhancing them vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the crisis um, uh, consequences. And the major reprogramming exercise that we have been going through um, by channeling uh, our uh, investment from our programs to deal with the crisis situation is still ongoing. And um, we hope that uh, the, from the EU budget, from our programs, we really help uh, regions, uh, member states, uh, everybody to survive this crisis. I will not uh, talk more about it, uh, but it's very important to say that. Um, uh, of course, we also are happy that the EU has proposed uh, there is an agreement between different uh, actors um, on the EU budget. And that is very important because this is one of the key instruments also to help everybody to survive through the crisis and then to come back to the recovery. 
And there we have thought very hard on, on how to make this happen because, uh, and there are different new instruments that we are currently working on, uh, particularly I want to mention react to you uh, and also recovery and resilience facility, which together with, with the future of Um, Somebody is interfering with my speech, but okay. Um, that together with, with the work on the future mainstream programs from cohesion policy should give us a sufficient range of instruments to address these two issues, to come out of crisis, call, go back to sustainable development, and then ensure that it stays and that it actually is um, uh, linked to this green and digital transformation that we have agreed at the EU level that this European Green Deal, uh, green and digital uh, transformation is our remaining. So we have to link these two sides together and we have to work hard to make it happen. And we are very well placed to do that uh, because on top of the, everything we have also, we are happy that uh, we have a just transition mechanism because this transition, of course, has to be just. And, and this um, principle that nobody can, should be left behind, no region, no person uh, in this transformation is very, very important to us. Um, so through the Just Transition Mechanism and Just Transition Fund, we will try to target also specific territories. Um, I think uh, I have set the scene for, for my main theme, uh, which is to say that uh, Baltic, uh, the, the strategy for the Baltic Sea region, we believe is also very well placed uh, to help us to achieve all these goals. The Baltic Sea strategy was the first one. Uh, it uh, was always um, focusing on the environmental challenges, uh, particularly, of course, in the Baltic area, but it has also, I think, shown the way, in a way that uh, this cooperation on a macro-regional level is very important and can bring some value added. Um, we hope this uh, is uh, now uh, a strategy which is very well known uh, by everybody, by every member state, every region, every stakeholder, um, and that we can also make sure that in future um, it contributes to these goals that I just mentioned. Um, uh, I do believe that uh, the macro-regional strategies have this place. And of course, uh, uh, we need to make sure uh, particularly also that this new action plan that we are discussing today, that it reflects, uh, and, and I think it does, uh, the draft as we see it on these green and digital transition priorities, and as well as takes into account lessons learned from the crisis. Um, it is not just about, you know, new priorities for the funding. I think we all understand, and this has been shown by the crisis, that there is uh, absolutely no other way for us to ensure that the future is there, is to really change radically this uh, thinking in our society and the way that we approach investment, the way we measure investment, and the way we measure welfare and the way that we prioritize our actions and this is a huge task um, uh, it sounds very high level task but it requires i think actions at all level. So more than ever, this cooperation between different levels of governance becomes extremely important. And that is again where I think uh, macro-regional strategies play a very important role because under these strategies we see that different stakeholders are brought together and the different levels of governance try to agree on, on the common priorities. So from the governance point of view, I think also the macro-regional strategies um, uh, has have their place um, in, in a setup of different instruments and uh, they should play even more active role, I think, in promoting the new green digital goals. Um, in terms of programming, uh, obviously, as I said, we have to focus on different instruments. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, already started in the current period in 1420 to promote the links between the goals uh, set under macro-regional strategies and the objectives that are put in our programs in the relevant priorities, and we will continue doing so. I hope that this cooperation between the 
uh, those who manage the macro regional strategies and those who manage our funds have become very uh, natural and that uh, it works together. And this is also something, this um, embedding of the goals of the macro regional strategies in our programming exercise is very, very important. And this is where also I hope this new action plan will, will make a contribution. Obviously, um, I think a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on funding for innovation and research. Uh, so again, this is um, this is this is uh, something which might be lost in this current crisis situation. But we all know that this is a key for, to ensure the the return to development and sustainable growth. And this is why. This uh, com, uh, using uh, the smart specialization strategies, but promoting more and more interregional cooperation. And this is where, again, the Baltic Sea strategy is well very placed to do that and help us also to develop, for example, our new interregional component five on, on the cooperation in the field of innovation. Also to help us to promote the thematic platforms, which we have developed under smart specialization strategy and different interregional partnerships, I think this should be um, the key instruments also supported uh, mutually. Um, we will, of course, work also on the ter territorial cooperation programs. The amounts of funding are smaller than this time around, but they are very important instruments. Um, I am slightly sad to say that uh, probably the reform that we proposed in the beginning will, will not uh, go because the reform we proposed under ETCs were really main that efficiency gains and, and streamlining uh, the management modes, but keeping the priorities as they are. Now we will see, but definitely the transnational program for the Baltic Sea, I think, uh, very useful. We will be linked also to the new action plan and to the priorities under the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. Um, and we have to make it work. Uh, finally, uh, I just want to stress that uh, it is very important to make sure that uh, also in terms of communication, that uh, people um, know what the strategies do uh, together with our uh, transnational part and, and other um, instruments of funding. We need to think about um, the, um, and there, there is a good experience under strategies with different flagship initiatives, projects. I think this is something we need to think about to try to prioritize also the efforts under the strategy and on our transnational cooperation strands, particularly to make sure that our funding really um, makes a difference. Let's put it that way, that it funds something uh, that, uh, um, is not just funded per se as a, as a cooperation project, but it actually is something where we can then learn something and we can mainstream, we can capitalize on these. So I think we should look at uh, different uh, activities under our transnational programs in, in that uh, context. Um, I want to thank you for your work, uh, everybody who's been involved in implementation of the strategy, but of course also uh, links to our programs, to our funding instruments. And um, I will stop here because uh, I, I will stay with you through the session and I will be happy to answer also questions if you have any. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Deputy Director General Poppens. And now it's time, and I, I think we get the same strong message here that we have heard during this day, which just, you know, strengthens, I guess, the message we want to end up with or, or also take away from here. So let's introduce our, our panelists. Uh, it's the largest panel we have so, had so far. Uh, Ms. Helena Turi, Ambassador for Baltic Sea Affairs, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Finland. Ms. Susan, Susan Shera, Director of Interreg, Interreg Managing Authority and the Joint Secretariat. Mr. Rüdiger Strempel, Executive Secretary, Helcom. Ms. Anne-Irene Setanes, Head of European Affairs, Eastern Norway County Network. Mr. Risto E.J. Pentila, CEO, Nordic West Office. And Mr. Igor Kapirin, Deputy Director of Department of European Cooperation.
Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Welcome, everybody. Can you, can you all either see me or hear me, or in the best of cases, both? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you. <laughs> Great, good. A distinguished, big, large panel, you know, the largest today so far. So it looks good. Hey, let's start with uh, Ambassador Tori. Please do tell us about the new action plan. What new perspectives or approaches does the revised uh, strategy action plan offer to regional actors? Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor, honor to speak here and address to, to all of you. And uh, we all, we know that the regional cooperation is important. And um, we also know that, uh, that the Baltic strategy has been a successful initiative, even more successful than, than uh, almost anybody could anticipate when it was created 11 years ago. But of course, uh, it has to be updated, especially the action plan, which is, which is the kind of uh, practical uh, part of it. And uh, it was a lengthy process, really. It, uh, it, was, it has been, had been planned for, for some years, and, and uh, all the stakeholders participated in, during these years, in a way or another. <coughs> Uh, then I decided this summer, in the end of June, I, I divide shortly in, in three parts. First of all, uh, we needed to have, uh, or we wanted to have an essentially shorter, uh, more readable and more understandable document. And uh, I think there we succeeded. It is now the, the draft, which is now in the commission. It is uh, less than a half of the size of what the, what the present action plan is. So it's, uh, at the moment, it looks like 79 pages. So it is, it is readable, I hope. And uh, the idea is it, that it only includes the, 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 the main, main rules, the main, main substance. And uh, we, we took away the, most of the descriptive parts of it doesn't mean that uh, that uh, what was included in the descriptive parts like list of, of organizations regional organizations that they wouldn't be uh, important anymore of course they are important but uh, the idea behind this was that the, the document was too too big too uh, too long so we needed to have something more readable and then the second one most important important part was of course the substance. It was outdated already. We had to update it. We wanted to, and we needed to include the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We, we wanted to show how this strategy can serve this, these goals. And uh, we also had to take into account EU strategies and programs and the future multi annual financial framework and uh, the emerging challenges like climate change, the pandemics, demographic changes, and migration. And also, uh, we all were of the opinion we needed to have more focus, less priorities, more focus. This, I think, we all agreed. Then we also needed to have uh, measurable indicators work plans and annual uh, reports so that afterwards, after some years, we can kind of measure better how, how this strategy, what it has achieved and uh, which sectors have, has, has it achieved most. So this is what we needed to have. And anyway, to some extent, we did, we did get that. This uh, substantial part, it, was, it is mostly drafted and written by the policy areas, the poli uh, policy area uh, coordinators. And, and uh, they made a big, big job. Thank you for that. And then the third part is governance, which is even more technical than what I just previously said. But it is important anywhere. We we needed to have clear roles, rules and uh, roles and responsibilities for all the actors. Effective, more effective decision making than uh, the the strategy had before and real results orientation. 
And also what was important was to empower all the actors, everybody who is, uh, who is acting and is stakeholder in this strategy. And, uh, and uh, we also needed, which actually included that we, we needed to have a closer link between the national uh, policy making and regional policy making, making and closer links bit, between uh, policy areas and uh, national line ministries. This is what we tried to do anyway. And uh, in order to, to make this um, more efficient this strategy, we made the decision to consolidate the, the resources which we already had uh, to, uh, to governance. And, and we decided to create a strategy point. We, and uh, our model was, uh, was the Danube strategy, who have a strategy point and uh, seems to us, I mean us is national coordinators group, that it, it works quite well. It helps, helps to lead the strategy and helps, helps, helps to be more logical, more efficient, and it uh, helps to have institutional memory, which is important to the strategy. Uh, <clears throat> the main message, I will, I, I will try to be short, the main, my main message to the, when I look at what was kind of the, the tie this, this panel, uh, about the, it was the, the revising the action action plan that it was a lengthy process and thank you for everybody to participating in it it was really valuable but now we have done that it is the, the action plan is not officially accepted yet in, it is in the commission so the direct rates generals are, are looking at it but uh, from from our part it is completed. And now we have to focus on, on implementing it, how to make the best use of it in this new normal, as, as Bettina Raphael said so very well in the end of the, the second panel, how to use this action plan and the strategy. And uh, I don't have uh, really substantial answers to that. I think it's it's uh, up to the each and every other substantial area and their policy area, how, how they use it. But uh, it looks to me that it's uh, it's really important to, to remember that we have this new normal, but we have to do both. We have to look at, look why the strategy is, look at these policy areas, like save the seas, still important, uh, co connect the region and increase prosperity, what has been done, but maybe in, in, in new ways, taking into account the, the new situation, the new challenges. And what is also more important than ever is communication. Because uh, what has been our problem in this strategy for, for I, I understand the whole 10 years, 11 years, during the whole existence of the strategy is that we feel like we do not have the political support we really needed. And that's why we might not have all the resources we would like to have in the line ministries and everywhere. But it's partly up to us. We, we must uh, communicate better. We must uh, uh, tell what the, uh, what the strategy has achieved and what it has to offer in future, then maybe it's easier to understand why have this strategy, why it is useful, and why it is useful for our political masters to, to support this. That's why, yes, that is, uh, and it's not only, only the communication people, not only let's communicate or the future, strategy point, but it's all of us, national coordinators, policy area coordinators, everybody to, to kind of think always that we do our best, but we also communicate about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Tori. Uh, a lot to sort of chew on here, but what about the other panelists' comments on the new action plan? And please, I think it worked well during the uh, earlier panels, so please raise your your hand if you want to, to say something, then I see 
who, who has something to, to comment. But anyway, the rest of you uh, five, who wants to, to start commenting and chewing on the new action plan? Who's first? <coughs> Pentila. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, congratulations on completing this uh, important strategy plan. I only have one point, and that is uh, what is the most important action in implementing this plan? And I would uh, say that in my mind, it is the maritime cities around the Baltic Sea region. They are listed here as one of the stakeholders who are important in all of this. But I would highlight the importance of the connections between maritime cities around the shores of the Baltic Sea, because they are uh, more uh, independent uh, and not so dependent on international politics and uh, uh, fluctuations in uh, uh, great power relations. So I, we actually, the reason I'm here is that we run a not-for-profit initiative called the C20, which brings together the leading maritime cities of the world. And quite a few of the maritime cities in the Baltic Sea region have already joined. And I see them as a key in implementing this strategy. So I would like just to highlight that uh, as a key actor in taking this plan forward. Thank you. Very concrete good sort of highlight there. And, uh, and now, of course, the question is, I know uh, who, who of you has actually seen the new action plan, but anyway, you heard the things uh, Ambassador Turi said, so at least you can comment on that. And of course, comment on what Mr. Pentila just said. So uh, I think uh, Setarnes at least raised her hand. Yeah. Please, uh, you're next. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to highlight especially the, the issue of the governance. So I think that uh, the uh, new action plan uh, put a strong emphasis on the governance issue. And as I'm representing both a neighbor partner country and as well as sub-regional level uh, institutions. So, so this kind of the new uh, action plan opening more for uh, all actors to, to get involved, to be involved more kind of inviting in also encouraging the um, uh, policy areas to do so when they set up their steering groups and uh, flagships uh, and initiatives. Uh, I think this is a, a, a very important way forward because there is a lot of energy and interest uh, around that uh, it could help to uh, make uh, the strategy even more successful uh, in the, so, so this is making use of, of this capacity and interest. Uh, I think the, the new action plan has, has put a very good uh, standard for, for that in, in, in the new version. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. And I noticed earlier, at least, uh, Susan Shara, you, you, you seem to nod or, you know, at some point of what Ambassador Tori said. So please, you can yeah. do you have a comment on that. Yeah, I guess I was not the only one who was nodding here, <laughs> but um, I certainly, um, I took in particular the last sentence very seriously that Helena said, namely that um, she said that we do not have the political support we need for the strategy and for the action plan. And uh, yeah, we must tell and explain much better than we did so far what the activities can actually achieve. Um, so I'm, you know, representing inter-Baltic Sea region, and uh, I think the main task that we have is to provide um, funding um, and uh, to focus on uh, the added value of uh, transnational cooperation. So it's not so much about solving particular issues, it's really about stimulating the cooperation and stimulating the networks, and of course also trying to make ourselves visible. Now getting back to what Helena said, I have to say, um, we do also offer some experience because the program has existed for more than 20 years by now. 
And um, we are still trying to catch the intentions uh, uh, and uh, attention of the political decision makers. And I can't tell you, uh, it's not very easy. Um, so I think um, the process is has to come from both sides. So there must be a certain interest, there must be a le belief that we can do more by cooperating on the one hand. And on the other hand, yes, we have to explain and we have to justify. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Kapirin, uh, you raised your hand as, at least. I think I saw it. <laughs> oh, no sound. Yeah, there's no sound yet. We, we, we can we can see you, but we can't hear you yet. But let's see, you can ba come ba come back a bit later. We'll take you back in a few minutes' time. But let's go to uh, to Strempel. Uh, I think you raised your hand as well. Ta can you hear us, Mr. Strempel? I did. Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes, I can. Thank you. Please go on. Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate all those involved in this update of the action plan, which I think is indeed a very manageable and readable product, um, which I think is helpful for a reason I'll come back to in a minute. It also retains the original three objectives, which I think is, uh, is of course, um, excellent um, and in everybody's interest. Um, and I would also like to point out that I think it's a fortuitous circumstance that this action plan is being updated to help updating its own Boston plan, something I may come back to later. Um, and um, actually, as of those who nodded, because there were points that Ambassador Turi raised, um, I would also like to and uh, one of the need to communicate, to possibly even step up communication, because I think it's one of the essentials and one of the key issues that we need to, to bring all of these projects to fruition. And um, the other point that um, was emphasized was the need to implement. Um, now, of course, we have been implementing. This plan has been implemented, and we're also implementing the Baltic Sea Action Plan. But there's always room for improvement, and I think we need to enhance and step up implementation. And so that was so those were two of the reasons why I nodded. But I think uh, this is an excellent piece of work, and I'd like to congratulate everybody who was involved in drafting it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Let's go back to Mr. Kapirin. Uh, let's see if we have the sound now. No. <laughs> we we only, only get the, the visual side of it, but not the auditive. But hey, anyway, hang on, so we, we might get Mr. Kapirin back a bit later. Hey, anyway, so going back a bit, because it, it all sounds very good, and everyone seems to be very happy with it, but so going back, it might be, of course, an... an Un insensitive diplomatic question, but anyway, any feeling of, of unnecessary compromise, something that could have been emphasized or done better, or something you would do another way if you got another chance? Just elaborate on that for a couple of minutes. Who wants to take this? Perhaps Ambassador Turi starts. Thank you. I can start. Actually, <clears throat> I must say that in the beginning, when we, uh, I have been in this top two years, and uh, the whole two years we have been discussing about this action plan, and my first thoughts were that we have to have much less uh, less uh, priorities and le much less uh, policy areas. So uh, in the beginning, I was for reducing policy areas, but. Uh, during the discussion, I very kind of quickly found out that it, it was a non-starter, so it wasn't possible. And then we decided to make the, the focusing inside each and every policy area, so that all of them uh, are now focusing between two and four uh, actions instead of ten or something like that, ten, five or ten. But now I must say that actually... I think this is totally all right. So at the moment, I don't feel like we should have reduced or got rid of any of the policy areas. It's just as good that we have all of them. So maybe this lesson is that uh, it's good that you don't always get what you want in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Comments regarding this? You're all happy. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, hey! At this point, actually, Bettina, do you do you want to comment at this point already? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
How about this? Are any questions or, or comments regarding the action plan as such? No, just a maybe time to, to remind the participants that uh, please uh, actively participate in the, in the, in the discussion and, uh, and send your comments and questions to the, to the message wall. And uh, we will then raise your questions from, from here. Okay, we just heard that your microphone is turned off. Okay. Can shall we try with Mr. Kapiri now? Do you get the is the microphone yes. open? Yes. Yes, okay, I'm great. Here. Thank you. Hey, Thank so you. anyway, um, so uh, comment on the action plan. Yeah. Well, for for both that. questions. In fact, good afternoon and thanks for this invitation. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not in condition to command the action plan of the EU. I, I can uh, only say that all the priorities and all the actions of the action plan have corresponding uh, activities and corresponding priorities in the Russian uh, documents of strategic planning. So the dialogue of two strategies is perfectly uh, possible. Uh, yes, in fact, the new action plan is more practical, more concrete, so we are ready to work uh, to work on on these basis, together with our strategic planning documents. And in, uh, ideally, we should promote so-called dialogue of strategies. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, so and uh, then, what about the if you take a look at the new program programming period for the interreg Baltic Sea region? What would the focus be? On that, Shara, do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes, Shara responding. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I think the focus uh, of our program at all times has been um, to do something. So, in a way, um, we have the experience how to make things happen. And this is our main, um, I would say, ambition also for the future. So our future naturally goes along uh, the thematic uh, priorities of the EU action plan. Logically, we are in the same area. Um, the program is not a strategy, it's a program. And um, I think uh, our responsible decision makers have no ambitions to create anything else but a supporting tool to the action plan on the one hand. On the other hand, um, we also we are facing a certain reality, namely uh, there will most likely be less funding available in the future. So the most difficult part for um, the representatives in our program are then to make um, a selection, to put a focus and to set priorities. So naturally, um, the Interreg uh, Baltic Sea Region program um, will not be able to fund everything under the new action plan. And if this is not possible, then at least um, it should be clear what it's going to be. So uh, currently, our program um, has been the main funding source for everything that happened uh, with the action plan. Um, I'm happy about it and I'm not happy about it. Um, I think you can understand why. That um, yeah, After those 10 years, we had hoped there would be more commitment from uh, the national actors in the Baltic Sea region. On the other hand, it looks um, many hopes are then linked also to our new program. And uh, if we look at the um, UN goals, if we look, of course, at the European Green Deal goals, if we look at the current situation and the recovery of the pandemic, then um, you won't be surprised that um, the thematic focus of the new program will also be green. So um, we will be looking at the um, impact of climate change on water management and on marine driven economies. And um, yeah, the program will also be supporting circular economy. Naturally, um, we will be dealing with low carbon systems and uh, green transport in all directions. So this is naturally the focus. And as I said, um, we won't be able to cover everything. Um, on the other hand, um, there are it's also very important to uh, support everything connected to innovative developments in the Baltic Sea region. 
um, our regions um, are facing disparities and um, it's certainly good if the program provides an opportunity for some to up or to link in. Um, uh, I think this um, is also quite understandable. Um, and here I would also like to mention what is a bit new is that um, a lot of emphasis will be put on strengthening the public sector because, um, in fact, and now we have learned this also during the pandemic times, that um, we need um, innovative, uh, competent and really reliable public services. Uh, they are at the heart of our democracies and of the functioning of our uh, public life. And um, they do also have a really big impact of uh, creating change in the sense uh, of the future objectives of the strategy and thus of the program. So maybe this is enough. Maybe I could also add uh, that our program also has this uh, technical function of the financing, uh, the governance structure. Helena Turi mentioned, uh, and I think Amirian as well, how important it is uh, to have a good governance and uh, a stable, reliable, robust structure for taking the strategy forward. Um, and uh, the core of that will be financed also from inter Baltic Sea region. Maybe so much for the time. Uh, Sasha, uh, thank you very much for that. And you said that there's something lacking, you know, from sort of a national response perspective, not, not, you know, reason to be happy with everything, but do you think the COVID situation actually can act as a catalyst for change and, and sort of like a blessing in disguise in this case? And get things sort of yeah I think forward. yeah i would I would very much um, hope so uh, because I'm always getting afraid when people say I would like to, uh, to have the times back when everything was as it was let's say one year ago <laughs> and I'm always getting really uh, very um, anxious to emphasize no I don't want to have this so if we don't learn from this crisis if we don't take it also as an opportunity for change like we are now doing in these digital formats here and um, then I think we lost a year, but um, I do very much hope that we we have um, made good time of using the year for thinking and for accelerating processes of change. Yeah, thanks. And I think as we stated in the last panel, is that we, we're never going back. We, we seem, it's a philosophical impossibility. We can't go back. We're always moving forward to something mm -hmm. which is, of course, new in its own way. How much then is new and how much is not? That's another question, but never going back. Comments on this, what you just heard Susan Scherer say and, and Ambassador Turi say? Anyone? Yes, Setanes and Pentila. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I just wanted also to underline then this um, uh, that the, the uh, partner, the neighboring country, the partner countries are invited into this uh, dialogue and also now are, are mainstreamed in the new proposal for the action plan because we are also part of the opening work of inter Baltic Sea region program, but also other programs. And, uh, and uh, for example, Norway as a, a part of the EEA is also part of other EU funding instruments like Horizon and Erasmus and so on. So, so of course, um, then the platform that we are cooperating on or around in, in the Baltic Sea is important for, for um, that it is inclusive so that also we can make use and, and have this interaction between programs and uh, the, the work uh, uh, from the strategy. So, so um, we are also, of course, in, in different formats of the uh, organizations and networks, which is also important for the driving force for the strategy. So I think, um, the new uh, way of, let's say, counting in or, or opening up uh, this uh, uh, relation, uh, both then in the strategy, uh, and it can fulfill more how we work with programming and projects and concrete actions all together. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, and before we go to, to Mr. Pentilap, uh, there's sort of uh, still a uh, sort of half hour window of opportunity to, to take part in the third and last poll. So please go and answer the third poll. You've still got some half an hour time left. Mr. Pentilap. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, regarding um, our priorities going forward together, I think it's quite clear that uh, a green transition is something that both the UN Union, China, and uh, very likely the United States in the near future will take as their number one uh, priority. So that has, of course, been very well covered in the document. But I would suggest that that be the sort of the focus of our endeavors going forward. And I would go as far as uh, uh, asking um, our panel and my colleagues here whether we think that uh, our region could be a global leader in this regard, whether we could set the ambition level so high that we can say we want to build back better better than anyone else and, uh, and really mm -hmm. increase the level of uh, uh, ambition here and perhaps get uh, more, uh, catch the attention of the political decision makers as well by pushing them into this direction. Mm -hmm. That would be my question to uh, others. Uh, and actually, why not? I mean, sort of, you know, pushing for the stars, <laughs> why wouldn't we put that ambition level? Uh, that's, that would be sort of another way to ask. But please, yes. Go on and, and, and answer that one. Should we have that sort of an ambition level? Global leader, this region. Uh, Ambassador Tori. Yes, of course. Why, why not? I think that you always have to have your ambitions high. Otherwise, you don't achieve much. So, yes, I totally agree. And I remind you that we will have one political leader uh, to to speak in the end, uh, Foreign Minister Harvisto, so we can answer him this question as well. Anyone else sort of aim for the stars, reach the moon? Anyone? Uh, Susan Sherra. Yes. Yes, thank you. So I think from from my experience, we are very good at um, yeah, having visions and ideas, including ideas about ourselves. Um, from what we are doing, uh, namely putting things into practice, um, I think this is where we can really get better at still. Yeah. So um, we have so many EU funding programs in the area, and now we've been trying uh, with a little tool that we have called Project Platforms to to link them and to, to make it easier for the ones looking for solutions to find a solution and uh, not to start from scratch again all over, for example. And I think we are good at talking big, but um, I think we should also be very working very hard towards accomplishing real activities, real progress, real outputs that we can work with later on. So if it's about being a global leader or not being a global leader, I think this is not so much the question, but uh, we need to be a bit yeah, reflective and, and critical towards ourselves and ask what can I do, yeah, change or what can I improve to make things happen. Yeah, but I think this question can, of course, why not be sort of superimposed on, on an EU level as well? I mean, what, is there sort of a, too much of, an, a shy, of a shyness for a reason or another not wanting to put the ambition, um, ambition level on being sort of global leaders? It, I, I it's some, uh, sometimes feel that we are sort of lacking that. Could I say something on that? Yes, yes, please. No, I think it's very interesting to hear because uh, we were just discussing internally. We had this brainstorming with the Club of Rome on how to actually make sure that uh, what we do now uh, in, in, in terms of fighting crisis and moving to green and digital transition, that we understand that this is not just about new priorities for funding or something. This is about profound change that we need to stimulate in our societies at the EU level and that we need... Uh, leaders, we need, uh, uh, you know, really um, this, uh, brainstorm how best to do this systemic change because there is not going to be, we cannot uh, go back to where we were. So this new normal and how to achieve it, and they were using the term Northern Star. And I think that was symbolic because it shows that uh, this Nordic Baltic region um, is perceived as a, as a leader, as a leading region inside the EU, definitely, uh, in terms of uh, making this systemic change. 
Uh, it, of course, requires a lot more than just new funding priorities. As I said, we need to rethink about uh, many, many aspects of uh, how we look at the society, how we measure wealth, how we, uh, how we you know, move away from pure mm. GDP to having uh, more sustainable, more social environmental indicators included in that uh, and, and all that. Now, and, and also, how do we change society? And, and there, I think the Baltic Sea region is very well placed. Uh, and also, this cooperation is, is necessary to cooperate. Uh, we cannot survive after this crisis and move to green and digital dream, as I call it, alone. We need to do it together. And I do believe that Baltic Sea region, with uh, all the yeah. forms of cooperation that are there, is very well placed to do that, at least to be a leader at the EU level. Uh, thank you. Sort of like partially, at least, uh, regarding the uh, the green future things. So, Helcom contributes to the Save the Sea strategy uh, priority. How, Mr. Strempel? Am I, Mi Mr. Str uh, yeah, is, okay? I, I, the Here, picture froze, but yeah, yes, you. we have you. Okay. okay. Well, I hope you do now. First of all, what was said just uh, regarding the global leadership, um, I think the issue is not so much, of course, um, about whether we are ourselves global leaders. I think the main um, issue is that we maintain a very high level of ambition. And if we do that, then, of course, uh, we can succeed. Having said that, from my contacts, and there are frequent contacts, of course, with other regions, and in particular, for instance, the uh, regional seas conventions around the globe, um, I think that in many ways the, uh, the Nordic region and the Baltic Sea region is perceived as a leader. So um, I think maybe if that is um, ourselves at, uh, as it is also echoed by partners around the globe. Now, um, Helcom, of course, um, as far as the Save the Sea, um, aspect is uh, concerned, is the regional player and together all Baltic Sea countries. And it's also between the EU and Russia, the other key player in, in the region, um, in working towards um, protecting the, uh, the Baltic Sea and uh, achieving good the Baltic Sea. Um, and in fact, this is also what we will need to focus on um, in the region in the next couple of years. For a number of reasons. For one thing, um, it is a joint objective, a common objective, both HELCOM and the EU. Also, uh, of course, to some extent, CBSS, dealing with sustainable maritime economy, and also, of course, of um, the uh, European strategy for the Baltic Sea region uh, with its objectives and its focus areas. Um, so this is our, our common ground, essentially. Um, I mean, there is, of course, the uh, EU SBSR focus area of save the sea. If you look at the, um, the first uh, lawology, according to which um, everything is interconnected, then, of course, the work of Helcom and what we do also co uh, contributes to the other three. Uh, the other. Yes, I think there was some disturbance uh, in the line. Uh, and, uh, I don't know whether you sort of wanted to finish already or whether the technical side cut you off. Can you hear me? Yes, now. Yes, please, please go on if you still wanted to continue. Okay, we'll come back to you later. Let's have comments so far. Anyone? Mm -hmm. What we've heard so far. Esa, how about any comments, questions from the audience? Uh, there's good comments, not directly questions. Uh, uh, referring to the earlier earlier discussion about the, the this more global uh, perspective and uh, and uh, world leading uh, type of, of goals, somebody reminding that the, the focus should be especially on on on, on add value, improve uh, the lives of citizens and uh, work on the ground. That's also important reminder. Then. Uh, uh, Regarding the EU funding, that that was also referred that uh, by Susanne Scherer, that um, this is of course uh, an EU strategy to to make sure that we are using the available instruments uh, uh, more strategically, uh, having less overlaps and having a better coordination, 
And then there's a reminder that there will be this uh, uh, 750 billion of EU funding through next generation EU. And now that, that is a huge window of opportunity for, for also for macro-regional collaboration. But maybe a commenting that, that still uh, when we need political commit, commitment uh, that we are calling for in each panel here, that, 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 that's an issue we, where, where we can improve so much that also that we need this, mm. this vision and uh, also that uh, this is a European-wide policy and there are other macro-regional strategies and, uh, and uh, we have opportunity also to, to, to work uh, Europe-wide and then why not also focusing on, on global competitiveness. So maybe bringing this back to Risto E. Pentila who, who brought this, uh, this uh, ambitious goal uh, that uh, from the business sector point of view, that uh, where do you see the opportunities and potential uh, from the just alone from business or competitiveness point of view, where and why uh, Baltic Sea region countries, mainly small countries, should uh, uh, should work here together in the region uh, with a, with a also global goals of of being more competitive in in of course, in Europe in general, and then maybe even in Asia, US. What, what are those maybe even concrete uh, examples where we can join forces? Yeah, good question. Well, I think, I think there are very, uh, two points where we can be <clears throat> leaders in terms of uh, Nordic and Baltic sea region companies, and they are one technology. Uh, I think that all of us have a very high level of uh, technology expertise, and that gives us a, a big uh, uh, advantage when we go forward into new technologies like 5G and uh, quantum computing in the, in the future. So I would see this uh, sort of technology cooperation that is very much run by big companies like Ericsson, Nokia, these type of companies uh, creating clusters in the Nordic region and moving forward, not only the big ones, but also smaller companies. And there, I, I think that we have a great uh, opportunity. And the other uh, area where I see uh, the uh, businesses of this region being able to really be global leaders is what we already discussed, which is the green transition. I think that this green transition and the green agenda that uh, is so strong within the European Union is particularly strongly supported by the citizens and the uh, uh, customers of this region. So I think that gives a good starting point for uh, two areas where we should definitely go forward uh, in uh, terms of technology and green transition. What I would then... Uh, be looking for from the policy side is that uh, uh, there are still uh, 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 problems in uh, having very different regulations around the region. There are still, although we think that we are very good at getting rid of, uh, of uh, borders, there are still uh, uh, sector by sector, there are things that we could simplify and find solutions that then could be spread to a more European level as well. So I, I would look at regulatory harmonization as part of the European agenda as, as an area where politicians could, could uh, may, make a big service to uh, the companies that are functioning in this area. Uh, but then if I understood uh, Susan uh, Scherer right earlier, so she, she said that uh, um, on, on national level, we've been holding back a bit. So, so we could have, uh, on, on the level of national decision making, things could have uh, been taken, taken much further. So is the decision making there holding us back still and how much and how will that affect us in the future? Or how much, much of, a, of a bump in the road is that? Ambassador Tori, do you want to comment this? Yes. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if I answered the question, but uh, 
uh, the problem is slightly that um, that although in principle we do get support uh, to the strategy from our political decision makers, so the in the in the general affairs countries uh, in the general affairs council every two years uh, the politicians decide that they they support this strategy and should be going on and. Uh, I, I count on this taking this happening uh, this year as well. The General Affairs Council will discuss about the macro, all the macro, macro regional strategies. But uh, the problem is that uh, somehow this knowledge doesn't go to all the ministries and when they are looking at the resources. So inside uh, line ministries in, in uh, different or maybe all our countries, they don't mm -hmm. get enough. The line ministries don't get enough resources, and the, the and the leadership in the in the ministries do not kind of um, put enough resources to uh, to cooperate under the umbrella of of this macro regional strategy. And this is which is holding us back a little bit. We would be more effective if if we would concentrate more on the strategy. We should understand that uh, this is uh, this is not something opposite to, to working on uh, national questions, but it is helping us because it's uh, it's mutual interest. We are we are cooperating because it's useful to us. It's it's more useful in some cases than to try and work nationally or just to work on EU level. But this this regional level it has its own value and it can can be the most useful way to work sometimes. So we should kind of be able to tell them uh, and believe that the, the, you should be uh, willing to, to give resources, which most often means human resources, to concentrate on, on, on this cooperation. The Baltic region is a very sort of it's very fruitful ground for cooperation compared to many other regions in the world. So, so basically, it's mm. it's all there, uh, Mr. Kapirin. Yeah, just to just to follow Ambassador's words, uh, I want only to say that the regional cooperation uh, in the Baltic and more to the north is fully supported at the political level, and, uh, and we we invest important uh, budgets to this cooperation and will continue to follow it, so you can count on us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I just also wanted to add that uh, there is a uh, a lot of political support and interest coming from the bottom up, meaning from from the city governments, from the sub-regional governments. And of course, they are also uh, highly interested in this uh, transnational interregional cooperation. And uh, I think that sometimes uh, national ministries can be a little bit more introvert into their own country and, uh, and concerned about the business in, in, in each country alike. So, so that maybe in this sort of involving also from, uh, from the political side, the, the, the lower level, the, 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 the city, they could help to push this ownership maybe also from, uh, from the bottom side and, uh, and um, also to, to raise the ownership uh, uh, both, let's say, from the top down, but also uh, from the bottom up. I think this is definitely the case when it comes to, to Norway that uh, our regional local actors are more, maybe more attention to the Baltic Sea, maybe more involved than uh, national ministries are at the moment. Thank you. So, so, so should we give more wiggle room to uh, cities, municipalities, sub-regions, whatever? I mean, do you mean, should we move a bit that power from national level to regional and community level or, or municipal level, Pentila. Yes, absolutely. I think that this is uh, the point I was trying to make earlier, that uh, we are perhaps concentrating too much on national governments, whereas those who really have an interest in pushing this agenda forward are cities, regions, communities, councils, and that sort of thing. So I, I, I truly think that that would be 
uh, money well spent and time well spent to concentrate a bit more on the bottom-up approach that our Norwegian friend so eloquently proposed. And uh, do you think, is this sort of a, a Could I realistic, your, is mean, this a realistic yeah. goal, do you think? I mean, I mean, is there political will for it? I think that if you look at what the uh, uh, leading maritime cities like Turku, where we are virtually meeting nowadays, are already doing, they are linking up with uh, uh, other cities, linking up with other regions, uh, uh, and this is uh, something that's already happening. So I think that we should perhaps recognize that activity more and include it uh, more in uh, our plans for the, for the region. Just recognize what's already happening and incentivize it. I could maybe have a comment on this. Yes. No, thank you for raising it, because obviously it just happens that half of today I spent in another meeting, which was about renewing the EU territorial agenda under the German presidency. Yeah. And you know that there has been, uh, uh, we have uh, been working a lot uh, with our cities and also, of course, now national governments, other stakeholders under the EU urban agenda. And it's clear that uh, the... Um, uh, regional and local, and particularly city, but also governors for different other territories, rural areas, um, it's very important to have them involved. And this is also part of our commitments from the Commission under these two territorial and urban agendas that uh, we need to make sure that, for example, the territorial impact assessments are, are a mainstream through our thematic policy making, that we um, have a dialogue and we, have, we, we, we really support the, the networks, but also when we look at our investment programs, you might have noticed that in our mainstream we have 8% now uh, earmarked to directly support urban sustainable development strategies. We are working together with DG Agri on the future uh, the vision for rural areas where we will try to bring them in under the CU territorial setup, under the concept of the functional territory, so not purely agriculture, but again, looking at uh, the complexity of issues that these areas are facing together. And I think this is a way to go. Of course, we have to, to face the fact that there are these different levels of governance have also very different <laughs> levels of responsibility in different member states and also this is why it's sometimes tricky for the commission to to come in and directly working with these players but certainly we have developed already instruments uh, we have uh, different possibilities to pursue this work uh, further uh, in now, we're also in, in many of our programs, capacity building for local uh, and uh, municipal authorities is one of the priorities. So we will keep uh, promoting uh, that approach. And I hope that also within the um, support um, under the cooperation objective under our transnational programs, we can also stimulate the, the exchanges between this level of governance because I like you all say, cities uh, are uh, and our rural areas together our, our territories are the key uh, actors if we want to make also the green and digital transition a su success story and if we want to achieve this new way of thinking in our societies thank you deputy director general and, and a bit on this note uh, we're soon uh, nearing the end but how will the cooperation with the neighboring countries develop within the strategy. So now on a very concrete level, I'd like to have a short answer for, from everyone. A quick roundup. We can start with Tori, we can go the full round, for instance. Uh, brief yeah. answers, please. Ambassador Tori, can you, can you hear me? I think the mic might be... T okay, you can't hear me now. Okay. Well, who's, who's still there? So the question... Now, now I can open. I okay, can yes. open it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so briefly, how will the cooperation with the neighboring countries develop within the strategy on a very sort of concrete level? Uh, uh, on a very concrete level, 
it will uh, it will go on as it has been going on and actually i think the the uh, neighbors will and actually i hope they will participate more in more uh, policy areas and in in more projects than than before because they are they are really welcome and I totally agree and underline was uh, what Anir and Seternes said in the beginning that this is really we we really welcome neighbors to come come here. This is this is exactly the message and they have have clearly understood it right. So I'm really happy. So the yes. uh, because uh, and I have to remind you that this this strategy a very kind of. Uh, uh, it's uh, down to earth. It's it's about project and and the kind of uh, really cooperation. It's it's not uh, not a political statement, but it's doing uh, doing on a very concrete level. So there there we will all be cooperating. And to what um, Risto Pentila said about the cities uh, cities are already participating and ubc their the union is participating but uh, in in different countries that there are different levels of governance cities and and regions and municipalities and everything you, it's it's complicated mm -hmm. and we, the Eagle, uh, mr Igor kapirin wants wanted to comment at least if we yeah. can't take the full round but kapirin please yes i will i will be quick uh, uh, in fact, uh, our regions, as I said, are very interested in this cooperation, uh, uh, in cooperation with the Baltic Sea strategy on the basis of our goals and, and ideas. Uh, we bring them to the programs and the, it can be proven by, by uh, the fact that we are participating in eight programs, seven cross-border cooperation from Norway to, uh, to Poland uh, and also the Baltic Sea region program. And this participation is very highly valued by uh, by our stakeholders thank you uh, and thank you then i have to i know about uh, uh, susan shera i think the you've been in the same position for the last 50 minutes so the picture might have frozen but are you still there i can't see if you have raised your hand or anything i don't think so no mm -mm. so ask any no, she, no. excuse me any mm -hmm. okay yes Okay, yeah, Pentila. Mm -hmm. Oh, you said Yes, just to this point. So, let's go back to her, yes. Uh, yeah, hey, yeah, sorry, let's say Setanes first and then Pentila and then Strempel. Yeah, just briefly, very briefly. Yes, uh, I, I just to underline that I, we have started already to, to think about how to involve Norwegian as more into the uh, uh, to the policy areas in, in line with what is now proposed to have a neighboring cooperation as a horizontal uh, sort of integrated issue in all policy areas. And I think it's it's opens for a flexible way of uh, finding better ways to cooperate because of a lot of the topics is, as Igor Kapirin also said, quite the same in Norway as it is for the Baltic Sea strategy. So finding the right actors to cooperate on and, and the right level they want to integrate. So I think this is now a, a good basis that we will work on uh, until the, the strategy is, uh, or the new action plan is, is operational from the beginning of next year and using it also to prepare for, for projects apply for the new funding period. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, briefly, Pentila and Strempel. Yes, I would uh, just underline the importance of programs that are open to neighbors as well. And uh, as we already heard, both Norway and Russia are already participating in these programs. So I think that the, what, the, what Susanna Schrerer, uh, Schrerer is actually doing uh, in, in funding this program is, is a key to cooperation in, in this regard. Mm. Okay, and Strampel. Can you can you hear us, Mr. Trempel? In yes, the meantime, I would like um, to add something also, okay. if I could. Because it's not just a transnational program. Uh, of course, we are looking at extending the transnational programs to our partners along the Baltic Sea. 
As you know, Regio now, since January, we will be implementing also cross-border programs, and I think there is something where we need also to look at the streamlining and making them more substantial for these cross-border regions. Um, so under the transnational, of course, this cooperation under the strategy for the sea, but uh, more importantly, we are now we are starting to negotiate also cross-border programs, and I think there is a very great potential to, to have a very concrete projects of cooperation uh, being proposed. It depends on the partners. Um, uh, they need to call, I mean, <laughs> they need to work with us and member states together to set up these programs, but uh, there are many, many instruments uh, available. Well, thank you very much. I, I think it's time for us to, to conclude. I think the, thank you very much for all the you know contribution for all the panelists and and Bettina. Yes, what are your I thoughts? will be very brief. I think what's hanging here a little bit in the room is whether we have the ambitions to become a global leader in green transition. We have the strategy, which is a tool. We most probably have also the funding and many of the cooperation structures. So, how, do we have the ambition? And the will? And the will and the political will. Do you think we have? That's the question. Are you hopeful? I'm hopeful. <laughs> That's good. Anything else? That's it. Okay, thank you very much to all our fine panelists, Ambassador Helena Turi, um, Susan Scherer, Mr. Rüdiger Strempel, Ms. Anni Rene Setanes, Mr. Risto Jepentila, and Mr. Igor Kapirin, and also uh, Deputy Director General Poppens. Thank you for contributing to the panel as well. So, uh, the materials from the forum will be available as soon as possible after the event, so stay tuned to our, for our newsletter, which we'll send out to all the registered participants. And to conclude now the 11th uh, Strategy Annual Forum, we're honored to welcome Pekka Haavisto, Minister, Pekka Haavisto Foreign Af Minister for Foreign Affairs in Finland. Welcome to give your final words on the event. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I, I hope you can see my picture and, and hear me properly. Yes, we can. Absolutely. Um, to start with, of course, uh, let me thank the panelists. This was uh, most uh, interesting what you contributed to this uh, debate. and. Uh, and, and also I want to, to greet all the participants of this most important forum, ladies and, and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to present the closing words uh, at the 11th annual forum of the uh, EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. And I was born and I have lived most of my life in Helsinki, located at the Baltic Sea, so the sea is uh, uh, included as part of my own identity as well. But I have to say that I really woke up to the Baltic Sea issues when we organized Kotka 1989 during the Gorbachev time, a, a big meeting of the citizens, concerned citizens around the Baltic Sea, including people from that time East Germany and, and from uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and from Tallinn, and, and so forth and so forth. And, and uh, I think what was said all, also by the panelists, how important the bottom up approach is, I, I just want to uh, share that view that, that many of these activities have started from the bottom-up uh, approach and, and this bottom-up approach is still needed. Let me begin by congratulating and thank organizers of the annual forum, the city of Turku, the secretariat of the Council of the Baltic Sea States and my own team at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs for managing to organize this forum. It is mostly due to their determination and flexibility that the first ever EU is BSR online annual forum has taken place despite the challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic that is concerning us all. One well, thanks also to keynote speakers, moderators, panelists, those who contributed to the success of the working groups and everybody else for the participation. Ladies and gentlemen, the program of the annual forum covers very well all the objectives and policy areas of the strategy. All the main objectives, save the sea, connect the, connect the region and increase prosperity, are of utmost importance for all of us living in the Baltic Sea region. That is why they were chosen in the first place. 
I can only agree with Commissioner Sinkevicius and others who spoke earlier today and said that saving the sea is a crucial objective today as the state of our common Baltic Sea is dire, and that we have a responsibility to protect the sea and the environment altogether, not only for our own sake, but for the sake of future generations. Achieving a good environmental status of the Baltic Sea is still a monumental challenge, and further effort and cooperation is needed from all the countries in the Baltic Sea catchment area. Finland has a special interest to boost circular economy in the Baltic Sea contest, especially nutrient cycling, in order to reduce nutrient loads to the sea. However, we all know that even uh, though, th though national measures are vital, they are not sufficient alone. We need also cooperation on many levels, on international, European Union, regional and local levels. Regional cooperation in the Baltic Sea region has long traditions, especially since the beginning of the 1990s. The wide network of regional cooperation, as well as personal and direct contacts with neighbours, are now more important than ever, as geopolitical tensions in the Baltic Sea region have increased and global crises bring on additional challenges, such as migration, climate change and COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, many of the emerging new challenges are becoming more urgent and need to be addressed in a coordinated way across country borders. The EU strategy for Baltic Sea region has been so successful in generating smart projects and networks to tackle common challenges faced by the region. It is a successful initiative that has brought significant results in diverse areas, even more than anticipated when it started 11 years ago. It has increased cooperation and networks across the region, and its implementation has contributed to the achievement on several EU-level, macro-regional, national and local policy goals. For example, the Innovation Policy Areas project have had an impact on smart specialization strategies in Finnish regions. Furthermore, it helps to implement policies developed by other platforms such as Helcom and, and CBSS. It is vital that the strategy will in future serve as a platform to enhance the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the transition to green and digital economy described in the Green Deal. It can also help in economic construction uh, needed due to COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, combating climate change, halting biodiversity loss and enhancing the circular economy must be key pillars of our green and sustainable recovery. However, let us not forget that global action is also essential. It's important that parties to the Paris Agreement come forward with more ambitious updated nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies under the agreement in 2020. I started by my mentioning the citizens' activism, and I, I still want to underline how important that is. It includes, of course, not only citizens and citizens' movement, but business communities, localities, uh, regions, people who are interested on Baltic Sea issues and who are eager to cooperate over the borders. I think that's a nucleus of, of the Baltic Sea cooperation. And many people also have their identities, not national identities, but identities can be regional ones. But, and, and Baltic Sea is one of the regions where you can bind your, your identity to and, and, and bind your activities to. And I'm very happy, particularly for the municipalities, that have been taking the action and, and particularly want to thank, of course, Turku in this uh, occasion. This Turku annual forum took place during an interesting period of time. The new EU multi-annual financial framework and topical global challenges will bring about both new challenges and new opportunities. The strategy and its stakeholders will be in front of a new era in the beginning of next year. I wish all of you the best of luck in your respective duties and plans within the EU strategy for Baltic Sea regions. I thank you. Thank you, Minister Harvisto, for your encouraging and, and kind words. Uh, we had a poll here. Let's see uh, whether the participants agree with the minister. We asked uh, about whether the cooperation will decrease or increase after the pandemic. So let's see the results of the poll. Yes, okay, on a positive note, we'll end this. Will the cooperation within 
the EU SBSR change after the pandemic, yes, it will increase 64, 65% almost, stay the same, a uh, bit less than a third, and it will decrease 6.4%. Uh, so we are ending this on a positive high then, <laughs> aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Which is good. So, uh, you know, to con conclude here, Bettina, Essa, Thank you very much. It's been great cooperating within this sub-region <laughs> here on, the, on this beach, green and turquoise beach with you. Uh, your, your final thoughts? I mean, we moved here between an abstract level and a concrete level, I think, Absolutely. Very, in a very fluid way during yes, the day. Yes, I think it was a great, we had some great panels and good ideas and I think I'm very positive. And some central core messages yeah. throughout the day as well. Yeah. Esa, what about you? Yeah, just uh, from the early uh, uh, keynotes, uh, when commissioners, for example, Commissioner Ferreira nicely emphasized the, the green uh, transition, green innovation, as a big opportunity for EUSBSR. And uh, then, then we had a poll about the most uh, promising areas of, of cooperation, and it, it was environment and innovation. And then there were, ni there were nice references in our, our panels about the different uh, uh, levels of cooperation and different kinds of opportunities in those key topics of our forum, uh, sustainability and innovation. And uh, it, it requires from the uh, audience comments and questions also in this last panel, there was a lot of reminders that we need people on board. We need to get closer to the citizens and we need to be able to improve the quality of life and uh, be able to better engage. So that is a strong message from the, from the audience. But then, on the other hand, we need this uh, stronger ambition and we need to look also at the global position of the region. And uh, I think there's, a, of course, there are a bit, we need to stay on the ground, but, uh, but uh, we need to be also globally, globally more visible and exa attractive. Exactly. And the pandemic, the pandemic is here around us. That's a fact. We can't sort of do anything to the fact. We can do, you know, handling it, but not, not to the fact. Yeah. So let's hope that acts as an agent <clears throat> for change and, and, and speeds things up. So, well, anyway, that's what, what, you know, the poll showed us. So that ended on a, on a positive high. Anyway, thank you all for joining uh, this special online EUSBSR. The strategy, I, I learned to say it better all the time, annual forum. Due to the circumstances, as you know, we were not able to host you in person here in Turku, which would have been nice, but we hope that this online annual forum has proved that we can find ways to connect and be better together and learn new things as well, even in a very sort of quick fashion, even during a pandemic. And now, with a final video, we wish you welcome to Turku in the future, uh, when we can again connect face to face. On behalf of the organizers and us, the moderators, thank you and stay safe. <laughs>